It's time for Mac Break Weekly. We've got a very special guest joining us this week, Rich Siegel uh, from Barebone Software, the creator of BB Edit, Yojimbo, and many other fine programs for the Macintosh. We'll talk to him about Apple's plans for the App Store, what it's like to develop for the App Store, and what he hopes Apple will do going forward. We'll also talk about a new security flaw that bypasses Gatekeeper. Don't worry. If you update, you're patched. Also, a new feature Apple's going to introduce that will provide rapid updates, quick fixes for urgent security problems. All that and a whole lot more coming up next, including Andy's weird hat on Mac Break Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 849, recorded Tuesday, December 20th, 2022. Decorate your notch. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Adigy, the only Apple device management platform that combines MDM with live agent capabilities to manage and secure your Apple ecosystem. Visit adigy.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial to see how Adigy helps you manage your Apple devices in real time. And if you purchase by December 31st, you'll get 10% off your first year. And by Worldwide Technology, with an innovative culture, thousands of IT engineers, application developers, unmatched labs, and integration centers for testing and deploying technology at scale. WWT helps customers bridge the gap between strategy and execution. To learn more about WWT, visit www.wwt.com slash twit. Thanks for listening to this show as an ad-supported network. We are always looking for new partners with products and services that will benefit our qualified audience. Are you ready to grow your business? Reach out to advertise at twit.tv and launch your campaign now. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show we cover the latest Apple news, our last show of 2022. And it's a very special episode. Before I introduce our special guest, let me say hello to Alex Lindsay. 090.media and officehours.global celebrating your 20th anniversary of Office Hours. Or what was it? <laughs> thousandth, <laughs> thousandth consecutive shows. We haven't missed a day since March 25th of 2020 when we, or yeah, 2020 when we, when we actually wow. uh, thought during COVID, we knew we should start this thing. So we had our 20th, or our, I'm sorry, you got me going thinking about 20th, but um, our thousandth. thousandth episode yesterday. You know, it's not going to be too long. Fun. Trust me, I know. Before you are celebrating your 20th. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sneaks up on you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, great. Congratulations. That's wonderful. And anybody who is not yet uh, watching Office Hours, you can see it on YouTube. <laughs> Best place to go is officehours.global, and you can find out more about all the cool stuff. It's not just one thing. It's everything. Sabado Gigante. Uh, my dear friend, Annie Anako, is also here dressed for the occasion. Yes, I'm, I'm. I'm in my holiday costume. I'm a. Uh, I'm a high-powered New York City, big city corporate financier who, along the way, uh, has, has climbed for power and material things. Has lost touch with faith and family, but he's coming back to his small town, 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 to actually to foreclose on the community center because he's it's always way too good an investment. Uh, but it's unlikely that he'll reconnect with an old, fa old flame that his mentor grandfather, who wanted him to be a musician artist, will. Tell him that maybe he's lost a little bit of something on the way. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that comes up. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I love I, it. Andy I'm, has I'm a backstory for his outfit. <laughs> I've decided. I've decided that I want to live that life that uh, that lifetime uh, holiday move, hold, lifetime holiday movie sort of thing. You know, you know what? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the maybe maybe the the Joe the 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 Joey that we grew up with isn't the Joseph Esquire that that moved off to the big city. I'm still the same person. Hey, let's go skate down to down to the the quarry with cardboard boxes, and then. Actually, he get, that he gets hat injured. makes you look like they, maybe you were getting ready for the French Revolution. So maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I'll take a, that, too, as long as, I'm, <laughs> as long as I'm on the right side of it. <laughs> and I love the tie. Again, is that a is that a uh, Jerry Garcia uh, that looks like maybe? I don't know. That is that is a uh, New York City thrift store. Oh, okay. Uh, I bought it last week. It, it is a Robert Talbot. Oh, a Talbot. Oh, and it is oh. it, and it is. It is best of class. Best if not, I couldn't say it on the yes. label. <laughs> Good to see you, Andy. Happy holidays. Also with us, Happy holidays. Jason Snell, who has delayed his 
holiday trip round the world in a sleigh to be with us. Uh, <laughs> That's true. It, it, here's my backstory, Leo. I'm a guy who works in his garage. <laughs> there you <laughs> That's go. My backstory. It's a simple story, but it's an honest <laughs> tale. And there's no heating out here, so I have to wear layers. Oh, and there's a uh, you're freezing. Are you, me. It's we are getting it's East okay. Coast weather. It might even be colder today here than it is in where Andy is. I don't know. Mm. It's yeah. It's a we, we're going to have what people in the East Coast would consider a mild winter day, and it's like freezing cold for <laughs> it's us. Forty nine degrees, sad. and I'm dying. I was going to say, is it like sixty degrees? You know what yeah. are we talking about? Here? That's actually as low as, Jason is as low as forty five. I think is. Can, can I can I add your backstory to mine? Where I come back home, and I'm surprised that my my best friend in high school, Jason, who always loved to tinker with cars, is still working in a garage. And although at first I'm filled with a little bit of contempt that you never moved out of our small town, that I suddenly come to realize that oh my god he has friends he has family he has children all the things that i forsook on my my holy my my my, my holy uh, dash up the golden ladder that now seems so hollow but things get interesting okay when andy meets jason's kid sister played by anne hathaway who has a cute <laughs> smile dimples and a fascination with mandy. weird hats mandy is her name mandy is her name and yeah, it's age, mandy and age andy it's, a, it's, it's age appropriate please what a story oh my god it's a love mandy story and andy together ages. at last i i hear heartstrings being plucked all over middle america i think we got something here get me hallmark get me hallmark right now all right poor we our poor guest has been sitting in the wings <laughs> it's it's time to bring him in mystery guest will you sign in please we've actually this is a uh, somebody we want to get on for some time now he's been on the show many times before but this couldn't be a better time given that the rumors are apple is op is going to offer a side loading on the iphone rich siegel is here from bare bones software uh good one afternoon long time apple developer creator of bb edit uh which is a must-have uh for anybody with a macintosh hey rich it's great to see you and your parrot may show up is it a parrot a parakeet what is it yep it's a, it's, it, it's a parrot. If you if you yeah. call him a parakeet, he gets angry. Yeah, but there, he's the big <laughs> the big brother of the parakeet. He's a beautiful right. gray, uh, and you have more than one, as I remember the last time you were on. I I, I do. I have two because I'm insane. <laughs> <laughs> and he is not in his cold garage. He's in his parrot shelter. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> Joining us today. There, there's one. I, if I occasionally look over to my left, it's because somebody is making trouble on the floor. Uh oh. Mm -hmm. Also, he <clears throat> so, is. Uh, Rich has a uh, little backstory. Removed the sweat sock from his microphone, and it turns out it looks exactly like the gray. And so there may be at some point an attempt to mate with his microphone. I just want to <laughs> warn the audience. Children maybe should avert their eyes. That's a hell of a show tease. That, that is that is what that is why you are a professional broadcaster yeah, yeah. Stay for decades. Stay tuned for the for the confusion. Uh, but you know, I, I, Randy in here. I got to say that's that's even more disturbing than the amount of effort that Andy put into the backstory. For his <laughs> well, I am a creative professional. It's we bring you on to disturb you, Rich. Actually, it was in the show last week. Jason reminds me that Apple. The rumor. From Mark Gurman came out that Apple was going to accede to the uh, e EU and allow side loading, perhaps even alternate uh, stores, app stores on iOS. And uh, you immediately came to mind, Rich, because uh, you had kind of a back and forth with the app store on the Macintosh. At first, BB Edit was not available there because you said there would be uh, too many limitations to what you could do. And then, um, and then I guess you put a stripped down version up and is it there now in its full fledged beauty? Uh, yep, yep. BB BB Edit is is in the App Store. Um, we were in the App Store uh, day one when when the App Store was first introduced, and uh, and we we did our best to make a go of it. But the 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 technology was a little bit immature. The politics were a little bit. Byzantine isn't quite the right word, but <laughs> there there were there were, there were there were politics. And we realized at the time, it's like, yeah, we, we just can't do this. Uh, Jason actually did a great piece in Six Colors uh, back in the day about that. And so we took a break from the App Store. And then when Apple relaunched the store for macOS Mojave, uh, they came to us and they said, okay, what do you need? And we said, well, we need this and then we need this. And it sort of boiled down to we need to be able to ship the same product to everybody so that we can give our customers 
the choice they want to have. Let them make the decision about where to get the app. And so we were, again, able to deliver a fully functional product in the App Store. Um, and Was that because Apple could, conceded yeah. things or? It was more a matter of um, the development and OS technology advanced to the point where uh, it was simpler for us to uh, conform to the requirements of the App Store. Uh, they added a couple of API features that we needed. Um, there was some, there was a little bit of grandfathering involved because we'd been in the App Store previously. And if you've been in the App Store, if you've shipped a product, you can usually make an argument with App Review and App Review and argument. They go to bed, <laughs> they go together like peanut butter and jelly. Um, uh, you can make an argument with app review saying, you know, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. This is what you approved before. It hasn't changed. Um, and we had a few of those conversations. I actually remember that um, when Apple announced its uh, changes, they mentioned you as coming back, right? They, mm -hmm, they, they mm -hmm. took your name in vain. And I, and at the oh, yeah. time I thought we should get rich <laughs> on to see if he agrees with Apple, what Apple's ascribing. Uh, yeah. Too. And, you know, it, it went pretty well. It's, it's, um, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of folks that, um, within Apple who are really working hard on our behalf. Um, and, and that I think made the whole thing feasible. Yeah. Good. So you're the, you're going to settle a bet. <laughs> uh oh, no, you're not. But Does that uh, mean somebody's <laughs> going to be mad at me if I give the wrong answer. That's yes. what, that's usually what that means, right? Al Alex Lindsay has been a strong defender of the app store and its exclusivity. Uh, he thinks it's better for consumers. He thinks it's fine for developers. Uh, and he really, uh, I think, uh, don't, I won't put words in your mouth, Alex, but uh, you, so you step in here, but you, I think you decry the whole idea of, of modifying the app store in any form. I, I don't know, but modifying the app store in any form might be a little heavy-handed. Okay. But okay. I mean, you there's plenty of room changes. for it to yeah. to improve and so on and so forth. I think that the the main thing that uh, and and my background a little bit for Rich, I don't think you see the show very much. So I've uh, developed you know a few apps that are there for other companies and so on and so forth. So I, I've gone through the process of it. Um, and so the uh, the the thing I guess I, for me as a user is I don't really. You know, I think that 99.9% .9 of the users, uh, given how many users there are out there, paid for something that's just like, it just works. They don't want to care. They don't care. <laughs> they, don't, they don't care what it Agreed. looks like. Yep. They just want it to work. They just want it to work. They don't want it to be start to be chaos. And where I see chaos beginning is not so much with what you're doing, but when Netflix or Meta or other companies say, well, we're only going to, we're going to have a new store. And you can only get Facebook on our store. You can only get Instagram on our store. In fact, we're going to build up a whole bunch of other things that are connected to us. And what, for the user, what that does is it takes something away from us. We still have the choice of not, not going over there and using their, their tools. But now what's happened is, is by making an update to the store, Apple has basically allowed all these other companies to take something from the user that we had before. You know, like, you know, and so we, and we are the ones that paid for everything. <laughs> like, you know, like we, we as the user, we mm -hmm. bought the apps, you know, we bought the hardware. We are the, the, in my opinion, the most important stakeholder, you know, in this, in this process, the developers are important you know, for the ecosystem, but the users are the stakeholder. Like we're the ones underwriting everything. And so I think that, um, so I think that that's, that's the concern that I have is mostly if you open up the app store or you create new app stores or you create side loading that companies like Epic and Meta and, Amazon and many other people build all these stores that don't, that then as a user, I have a choice of either having to now deal with all a complexity that I didn't have to deal with before. Um, and in light of Epic's lawsuit that they just lost today, <laughs> you know, of privacy, I have, you know, these stores are not, may not be the same level of, of security or privacy that, that we have with the uh, current app store. And so, so I think that I, I think of it from, I think the prism that I'm looking at it to is from the user, um, you know, otherwise known as the person, the people paying for everything <laughs> that we're doing here. So, so. The, the, the customer as I, as I, as I like yeah. to call them. Right. Yeah. So um, I, th I know, think the user, cause I watch too much Tron. And we should so be anyway, clear that Rich, you don't have <laughs> an app for the so, user. You don't have yeah. an app in the iOS app store, right, Rich? I mean, uh, um, we, we do, we do have an oh, app in the iOS app store. Oh, it's, okay. it's the iPad, it's the iPad companion for Yojimbo on the desktop. Oh, okay. Uh, so, you know, we, but we, you know, it's not, 
it's not the app that we're known for. It's not the app that makes our living the iOS app. Uh, it because it's a it's really a companion component. Um, um, it's it's not a big player. But you do have some I experience mean, with the App Store process, then. Uh, yeah, is the, I mean, is the, 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 the iOS, iOS App Store very different from the Mac App Store in 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 that regard? No, the the experience is identical. Okay. Um, the only I think I'm sure on the back end it's a different reviewer. Yeah. Or different reviewing department. Well, it can't be just uh, one person uh, doing this. <laughs> anyway. It could yeah. be. It could be. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> it's that slow. But um, um, actually, yeah, no counter argument. It couldn't possibly be because nobody seems to remember anything. But I digress. Um, Alex, I think all of your points are 100% are valid and, are, and on target. Um, I think there is a very real risk that these big, big, big players will do precisely that. They want to be able to monetize their platforms because that's what they have, right? Netflix is a platform. Meta has a platform. Epic has a platform. They want to be able to monetize their platforms uh, without Apple's interference, if you will. And uh, the best way to do that is to not be tied to the App Store. I agree. I, now, on the Mac, you can do that, as you have. You can still uh -huh. sideload on the Mac, but you can't on iOS. Uh, Correct. And I guess the question... That's mostly a legacy issue. That's mostly a legacy issue. Right. And, 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 and to, to your point, yeah, and uh, that's because the Mac has its origins in 1984, right. and there's a, a long-established pattern of... of of install of user installation of the software yeah c um, crazy but computer users have this notion they should be in able to install th stuff on their yeah. computer <laughs> if apple were to take that Imagine. away there's a lot of people myself included who would stop using macs well, not, none of these, none of these budget fourteen hundred dollar laptops i mean <laughs> when you buy the three thousand dollar pro yeah you have higher oh, expectations yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Well, and we I'm were sorry. very worried when Gatekeeper, uh, you know, took over and, and became stronger and stronger that that might be the, the direction well, Apple's and, and, taken. It. And again, from I, I think that there's a larger number of people that are doing things. There. There's more peripherals. There's more things that you connect to on yeah. a Mac. It's, it's a much it's a, it's a more complicated, more heterogeneous environment. You know, yeah. I, know, I know as a user, um, if the product has to be very unique for me to not buy it in the App Store. Like it, I, I have to look at it and go, well. I can't yeah. find that anywhere else yeah. because man, opening up a computer and hitting install everything back on this computer nice. is magical. Like, and yeah, so the, I, the, yep. Yeah. The user so. experience provided by the app store is it's a well-crafted, very smooth experience. You know, a, a non-trivial quantity of our customers prefer the app store for that reason. It's like their updates their updates happen. Their, their software is all, always available to reinstall when they need it. They don't have to think about their credit card or their, you know, their billing mechanics. It, it all just happens. It, it just works. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, that's a, that's a valid reason to, that's a valid preference. Um, that's one of the reasons we're still in the app stores because we know that a lot of our customers want that. I keep thinking um, of it as being like, there are two different things at play here. One is the home field advantage of being a platform owner. And the other is the monopoly power. <laughs> And um, I don't think I have a problem with the platform owner having a home field advantage. It is their platform. So to mm -hmm. a certain degree, I think it's okay. The challenge, of course, with Apple is that on iOS, it's also the only option. And I think we've seen with like even what Epic tried on Android, right? They tried to just take their ball and go home. And the fact is, it, I think there are very few companies that have so much power and so much draw that they are willing to forego the default experience altogether in order to force you into an outside download or app store. There might be some, but I think like somebody was saying, oh, Facebook will send up their own app store and you'll have to download the Facebook app store in order to get Facebook on iOS. It's like, I don't believe it because Facebook knows they need to be on the iOS app store because 
that is always <laughs> going to be number one for users, for most users who are never going to want to turn off that switch. And although an outside vendor like Facebook might have some leverage, there there is a limit to the leverage. And saying you can only use Facebook's app on your iPhone if you turn off security that Apple puts up a lot of scary dialogue boxes, like that is a, it's a big move. They could try it, but I bet they're going to regret it and they're going to be back in the app store if they do. So I think mm -hmm. that's the challenge is like accepting that Apple has, and the Apple app store will always have the home field advantage, but allowing people to escape from it if they choose to like i can imagine amazon offering a better version of the kindle app and the comiXology app yeah. outside of the app store but i can't really imagine them saying we're never going to be in the mac in the ios app store ever again yeah i mean the th for me the th the thing is that uh if if apple's dogmatic approach towards taking a percentage of all revenue generated by every app uh, uh released on the iphone is the, if that's going to be held as just absolute dogma, that could become a poison pill for every business, for so many different businesses. And th I think it's reasonable for these businesses. Again, no, don't cry for me, Amazon, but there's, there's uh, for a lot of different businesses, there's a real good reason for them to ask, what did you do to earn 30% of the sale of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of this week's uh, Superman comic? You did nothing. I mean, yes, you, you, it's, you provided an environment for this app to exist, but I would also argue that Apple benefits from the Kindle app being available Available and the Facebook app being available and the Instagram app being available and streaming game apps being available. And when you basically say that, look, our profit margins are such that we anticipate being able to make X dollars from in-game purchases or, uh, or in-app content, and you basically shut that door, there is going to be kickback. And with my, my biggest uh, positive uh, thing about all of this pressure on Apple is that it is pressure that Apple almost never has to deal with. We've seen so many changes uh, for the App Store in the past three or four or five years. None of them came out of the goodness of Apple's heart. None of them came after a frank and honest self-evaluation of what the policies were set when they first set up the App Store and whether they're still important or relevant now. It's because they were getting pressure uh, from other companies, from developers, from from governments across the world. So if this, if the new, pre if a presence of a new app store uh, is uh, actually happens, and all it does is basically says to Apple, okay, look, you've basically, basically now there's a, basically now every uh, Facebook and Amazon and all these other companies, they have the weapon in their drawer. They can now make a decision about whether they want to actually now uh, sideload an app provide their own app experience just so that they can can't hold on to uh, uh, all these in-app in purchases. Apps, I think Apple now would would have to respond to that in a way that's a little bit more important than what they can do now, which is to say, hey, we're Apple. You can, we can't make us do something we don't want to do. And I think the danger, one of the dangers there <laughs> is that we were assuming all of this in a vacuum. Um, you know, users, uh, you know, if if stuff starts to get pulled away from them, and we don't know if your Jason's very valid, they may they may not do that. Um, but if stuff starts getting pulled away, you could end up with a fair number of of angry users, and you end up pitting the users against the against the the the, the, the stores. And you know, people will think that it takes millions of people to uh, um, to cause trouble, but it takes about uh, less than a thousand people that are committed to just ruin everything for everybody <laughs> committed and organized you can cause an enormous amount of damage with a very small number of people and mm -hmm. and i think you know trolls can cause trouble with three or four of them <laughs> if, if you get a thousand of them that are angry and if they start if the if the stores actually start to take traction and they actually start to exclude people you'll end up with a lot of um fuel in the air you know like you know and 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 it's just a matter of people probably like me <laughs> that will that will light start lighting lighters I want you know to mention, and you know oh, and so the ahead. thing is is that is that the um because you know a lot of i i view it again is i don't i just want my stuff to be secure and work like as a user i just don't care like i, I just want to be clear like i don't care i've done yeah. a bunch of i've developed a bunch of apps i give it two to three weeks to get into the app store we go back and forth a couple times and then i end up with an app in the app store you know and i most of my apps have been, you know, not charged for and the ones that have been charged for don't have it made over a million dollars. So I'm not thinking 30%, I'm thinking 15, which is 98% of the developers out there. Um, so the, um, so I, you know, as a user though, all I care about is that when I download something, I don't want to worry that it's going to be tracking me or, you know, selling things or doing whatever. And when I, um, and I just want it to work. And I think that that, if we get very, I think the real danger is that, uh, you know, that, that 
I think, and I and I do think that we'll see in Europe if if Apple actually does this, we'll see what happens. But it could just end up with a lot of chaos. I know? just think I just think you're right. The users in the end are the are the answer here, and they're going to want to keep it simple, and that's why the App Store is going to be the default and remain the default. I think the the difference is just right now everybody has to be in the App Store because there's no choice. But um, well, there is a choice. It's called but, Google. Android. Well, I mean, because there's no choice <laughs> on that, iOS. You know, it, Apple always it, says only, that, and I just hate that. I guess that's yeah. not a... It's yeah, a well, it's, it's, a, it's, also, it's also not right because if you're an app developer and you write an iOS app and it gets rejected, you have nowhere to take it because you can't just take it's it to Android and install yeah, it. It is, it is very limited. But my, my point is more Apple doesn't right now have to compete on the fact that it... The, the things that are true, the fact that it is safer and more secure in the app store and they do approve things and scan things and they do use their own payment system where your credit card already is so it's super convenient and you have a level of trust that you might not have on the outside right now those aren't competitive issues really because there's no competition but they will be competitive advantages to that default app store regardless and i also want to throw out one other thing which i know rich definitely experienced which is apple being motivated by uh, market issues in terms of their app store can change Apple's behavior too. The Mac Absolutely. app store got a lot Agreed. better when Apple realized that lots of key apps, including Rich's, weren't there. And they started asking questions about like, why is that? And can <clears throat> we fix it? And if and in a scenario where Apple has a little bit of competition on its own platform, I think Apple's app store will get better because they know they're going to need to be better. But I, I think they're fundamentally going to be better right out of the gate just because of everything that Alex said. It is, you're much more you know, safe and it's convenient and it's easy and like, and people don't want to bother. People want it to oh, just be easy. There, there you go. That's the point of competitive regulation uh, yeah. to, to encourage well, competition and to make everybody better all around. I, I, I'm sure what Apple's going to do, as you've already said, is just have a switch that's, you know, barely seen. We showed last week Google. It's it's hard to find now how to sideload on yeah. on Android. Uh, they're going to do the same thing, and it will it will uh, uh, you know follow the letter of the law. But but ninety nine you know the default of the, the, the tyranny of the default ninety nine percent of users won't know or care. And I you know I don't see how that's harmful. Do you think that's harmful, Alex? It's it's only if if the uh, what arises is is big big store. It's not. It's not if a couple apps want to be sideloaded. That that doesn't mean anything. It is, in fact, it'll be probably not a great, not a great experience. Uh, it is, it is if there are big stores that start to make things exclusive. So if if you start seeing an Amazon store or win, or my my Windows store and a, you know, and they really start forcing new things to that to that puzzle is where I think that um, it'll be it'll it'll be problematic. You know, and and again, I think that there are. Ways for users to take 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 their case just directly to the store, um, you know, through uh, resistance, you know. So I think that there's lots of ways to, of making that, and uh, so I think that 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 can be done. But it's still just a bummer that it, it, you know, like for for us, I guess I don't I don't see how much of this positively affects ninety nine point nine percent of the users. Isn't yeah? I, 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 I th go ahead, Rich. You're the you're the expert I, here as a developer, yeah. so. I, well, I, I, I was just going to say that, um, I mean, you, you, I, I, I'm not trying to like butter everybody up, butter everybody up, um, but you're all making really solid points. And I think, I think uh, Jason's right on by saying what's going to happen here is um, I think this is going to create motivation for Apple to improve the pain points that give developers a reason to not want to be in the app store. And yes, okay, at the moment, they don't have a choice. If a choice gets forced on Apple, then smaller developers who are overwhelmed by those pain points will say, yeah, maybe I just don't need to deal with this. I'll build a developer ID notarized app, which is what you do on Mac OS. And, and uh, my customers can, can download and install that. Um, I think the really, 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 really big players, Facebook, uh, sorry, Meta, Netflix, um, and so forth, they're going to stay in the app store, but there's now that little, little bit of, of cloudiness on the horizon that gives them, I think, negotiating power, right? They can say, you know, 
if you want to charge us too much money for what we're doing, or if you make our lives too hard, we will go open our own stores. Yeah. But, and, and I think what they, I think what they're going to want more than money is data. Like that's what they, that's what they want from us. <laughs> well, and you know that companies yeah. like Epic or, yeah. you know, and, and my, I guess Microsoft and, EA have been champing at the bit to open their own uh, gaming stores. It's right. not clear. First mm -hmm. of all, let's again underscore, this is a rumor. <laughs> it's from Mark Gurman. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Mark had all, so many details. It feels like he had probably inside knowledge. Uh, and we don't know what Apple's going to do exactly. They didn't, even in his story, Mark said it wasn't clear if Apple would allow other third-party payment systems. You know, Apple's going to do the minimum that the EU will accept. And that's yeah. probably a negotiation. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we don't know yet what it's going to, what it's going to look like. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I just can, feel like I, you I, can I, say, I, you can say, and I think you're right. Uh, all of you that, it, that it, the users are what really count, but I'm going to defend the developers too. It's important that you have developers on a platform and that developers, I mean, you can treat them unfairly to a certain point, but at some point you could chase I mean, them away. I, I guess, and without apps, you're, you're, I, get, I got to tell you, Windows Phone died for one but, reason only, but, because there were no developers for it. But but the developers aren't, it, it, Apple's not like losing a lot of developers. I mean, it's the best, it's the best online platform in the world. Like it is, it is worth a, putting, people can, and I'm sure Rich can complain agree. about it's it. It's worth but, putting but up they, with the trouble because you're in the app store. I, I, you know, Rich has been developing longer than I have, but, you know, I've been developing apps since the late 90s that I've been selling on a variety of different things. And I got to tell you, like for me, uh, given that no app has ever made more than a million dollars a year that I made. Um, so 15%, like I paid, you know, Digital River was 23% you know, percent <laughs> yep. for nothing. Like, like yep. you know, and I don't have to manage security. I don't have to, like, there is so many things I don't have to do as a developer. As a small developer, for 98% of developers that are out there, pretty magical little place. Now people, you know, like it's the, the for the 98%, they're paying 15% that are, um, uh, that, that it's for the big, bigger developers that this starts to hurt because it's, it's, it's a lot more money, um, for, for them. But I think that it's, it is a, um, the problem is that all things are confidence game. And if the user starts to get frustrated with the apps, if they start getting frustrated with the platform as a small developer that I am at now and again, I'm concerned that there's two things that I'm concerned about. One is as confidence lowers, we start to end up with people not wanting to buy, not buy as fluidly. Like I go to on the app mm -hmm. store now and I go, oh, I don't know if I like that app or not, but I'll download it and buy it just because I want to see what $4 gets me. You know, that may go away. The other side of it is, is the most efficient thing for Apple to do if there's any real competition is to start building subscriptions like Arcade. So the, the most... You know, Apple's most efficient way to continue to generate revenue would be to have a bigger subscription that's a little bit more that gets you productivity apps, gets you, you know, and starts to, you know, just dig into that. And that as a small, as a big developer, that's not going to affect Epic. But as a small developer, that's, you know, if Apple starts taking up that that space to generate revenue, it's a real, really painful, you know, like, you know, for for people to build their own thing when, again, there's a, there's a thing that I don't have to pay. I, don't, I pay a subscription, I get it all. So yeah. that's, those are the two. And again, we don't know what is going to happen, but that's the thing that I worry about is I have something that I'm quite happy with as a user. <laughs> like, I'm, yeah. like I, I don't have any complaints as a user. And, and even as a developer, I haven't run into any, I mean, we've gotten a kickback and then we, we figured out I'm, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to release something the next day. Like I, we, we sit there and we have in our timeline, there's a, either a two or three week window of we're going to finish the app and then we're going to do the app store thing and then we're going to come out the other end and you know and and so when you, a lot of complaints i find obviously someone's trying to do something really exotic or they're trying to do something in a very short type time frame which is you know and those are the two things that we see people complaining on twitter about you know and so the thing is is that i think that um we have some and i've just seen this happen in other places we have something that works really well we don't know what all the ingredients are. And if we start pulling the ingredients out, we may end up with something a lot less that we can't put back into where it was before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, we, 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 we've been talking a lot about like just the money part of it and the financial part of it. One of the things I really want to ask Rich about is that like, since you've got like BB edit, you've got customers you, you get from outside the app store on the Mac, you've got customers you've got from inside the Mac store, uh, uh, app store on the Mac, like, is it harder? To, what's what's the difference between your relationship with your customers? Because it does feel like Apple makes it really hard to know who your customers are, to, dis, to respond directly to them, to make life better for them if they're buying through the App Store. And I don't. That's that's not one of those dogma things that I really wish that Apple would reconsider. But I, again, I'm not a developer. 
Well, that's a really good question. Um, uh, the the App Store fundamentally it makes it impossible for us to have a relationship with the App Store customer, and I'm 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 sorry about the glare. <laughs> that's um, good. It works really well with your head. I think. Uh, oh, geez, uh, that's all right. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sitting for your Voight Kampf test. Now, you're walking along a, a dry riverbed. You see a turtle on its back. <laughs> a little, uh, a little uh, Blade Runner reference. Okay, keep going. So, so, so um, um, Apple does not share uh, customer data with developers, uh, App Store developers. So I have no idea who has purchased BB Edit in the App Store. And we're very careful about the relationship we have with our customers. When, when, when somebody, when somebody buys from us, it's not a license to spam them, but we do have a mailing list where we occasionally send out news and announcements and app store customers miss out on that because we can't connect with them. We can't find out, uh, we don't get a report, uh, like we do from our normal e-commerce provider. Uh, we we don't have a record of the sale. We don't know how to get in touch with the customer if something is going on, like hey, here's a new update. Um, nothing like that. And the only way we find out if somebody bought in uh, from the app store is if they write to us for technical support. Um, and this is actually a sore spot for us because um, we have occasionally customers who have store issues. We can't help them. There's nothing we can do. There's, we can't look up their purchase to find out if they have an active subscription. We oh, you don't even get find... that information. You don't get anything. Nope. Wow. We get nothing. Wow. We get nothing. No. And, um, and while I wouldn't mind you contacting me as a user, I don't uh -huh. want to give my information over. Like, like I want to buy exactly. This. I and I don't know yeah, you. I don't want to, you know, like to. for 99% for of the apps I buy, I don't want to have any interaction. I choose not to. And I definitely don't want to get an email. Right. It, I, I, I think that the amount of engagement ultimately should be in the customer's hands. Um, if, if a customer ticks the box that said, I don't want this developer knowing who I am. Absolutely. No problem. It, you know, that could even be a default, although, you know, folks don't like to change defaults. Um, but for customer service purposes, there's nothing we can do. There's, there's not even, a contact we can write to and say, Hey, this person wrote to us and they're having a store issue. Um, can that's, you get in, give, get involved and help them out? That needs to be, I, okay, fine. You don't want to give up that information, but there needs to be a conduit. You know, uh, we have something somewhat an analogous. If people have trouble with a sponsor, they often write to us because we introduce them to the sponsor. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I can't obviously solve a problem that you're having with a third party, but we always make sure we have a way to send that complaint directly to the sponsor uh, with, at a high enough level so that the sponsor is going to act on it. And that's worked quite well for a lot of our listeners and a lot of our sponsors. Um, it yeah. seems that would be the minimum Apple could do is at least give you a – I can't believe they don't give you a contact – uh, for tech support, I guess they don't want to. I mean, it's a, such a huge scale. Maybe they yeah. can't support it. I don't yeah. know. <clears throat> and, and, I, as, and, and as a quick, side, just as a quick side note, and another bit of praise for for Barebone Software. One of the one of the reasons why Rich and I are such good friends are because this is one of those companies where. I'm at, it's 3.30 in the morning. There's something about BB edit. I don't understand. I, I fire off a very tired and maybe not very formed email that uh, might, might include the phrase, this is a piece of crap. Why the hell would anybody do it this way? <laughs> and then like a half hour later, I get a very kind and open like, gee, I'm sorry, but here's, here, let me explain why this feature works the way it does. Why is it, but why is it not working the way you want to work with it? And it's that kind of relationship that you kind of want that kind of makes you a repeat customer uh, two decades case later and it kind of frustrates me that apple's just again as a dogmatic thing is simply saying we're not going to make it even possible for someone to choose you know, even even if uh, even if someone has recommended bear uh, bb edit specifically because their tech support and their support is so personal and hand-holding and good no we're not going to let you have that relationship because dogma yeah yeah speaking i mean of, that, that relationship is our stock and trade i mean that's sure. That's that's, that's who we are. There are very few companies like BB Edit like that. But it's as important right. as your product. I mean, uh, I think that's yeah, true. Absolutely, absolutely true. Um, 
And I, speaking of dogmatic, I'm absolutely dogmatic in the other direction. I think all software should be open. I think all you should only yeah. use non-proprietary <laughs> software. Uh, I don't live, I don't, I don't walk the walk because the iPhone is uh, clearly a superior platform to the Pine phone running uh, Monjero Linux. <laughs> Unf unfortunately, because I would prefer to use that, but... Well uh, uh you know, kudos to to rich because he does a great product and rich i you know i, I think absolutely you, you know but we talked a couple of weeks ago about bb edit and how great it is in the new version 14 the the, the we love the reg edit and the reg edit play playground it's just fantastic oh, i yeah. love the the command line interface so i can do mpw style uh, terminal right. so that I have shell a worksheets. Somebody shell. actually asked me about that on Twitter. They're like, what were you and Leo talking about? And I'm like, it's shell worksheets. <laughs> if you've Man. never shell used it, you will never go back to a normal terminal. It's just the best. Even Emacs doesn't do it. And uh, now that you support LSP and I can, you know, do my lisp in there, I think it's just a really, it's, it's gotten better and better and better and better. And there's a lot of it's credit to hear. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. A lot of credit to you. Uh, and, and I presume your team as a, as a developer, but also to your customer base who have supported you for, congratulations, 30 years. 30, 30 years come come May, I think it'll be. Yeah, pretty yeah, amazing. And, and yeah, 100% one, 1 agreed. It's, it, you know, the customers, our customers, the ones who are new to us, the ones who've been with us this whole time. I've, so I've bought um, every update, every freaking update. I don't know when the first one was. But uh, it's, thanks to it, you, I can have pizza tonight. <laughs> uh, it, the uh, times have and, changed a little bit. It was for a long time. You know, if you were a web developer, you were using BB Edit to craft your website, your pages. Yep. I don't yep. know if that's still the case. Who who do you think uses BB Edit these days, Rich? So so we've seen uh, to to your point, we've seen um, some some shifting in in who our audience is. Part of that is the ecosystem, right? Um, folks don't spend much time crafting HTML no, anymore. They in sure don't. Instead, yeah. <laughs> uh, instead, they write code that generates it. Right. Or they use systems that generate it, I, right? They, they build websites using WordPress. And, and so they'll write their posts in a, in a product like uh, Mars Edit, another great indie product. Um, but they'll use BB Edit as a front end for Mars Edit to write their content. Um, oh no, he just described me. Ah. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, authors, journalists, technical writers, data scientists, um, yes, still developers um, who who want that lighter weight environment than, say, Xcode. <laughs> Those folks that actually want their website to work. Yeah. Um. <laughs> no, but if you're using VS Code, you really should look at BB Edit because now with LSP support, um, BB Edit is a, is a peer to VS Code, but it's native. It's not a Electron app, and it really is great. I mean, yeah, I yeah. It, there may be Thank a whole you. new generation of people starting to use you, which would be it's kind of a, an intriguing yeah. thought. Jeez, on top yeah. of everything else, I'm, I'm glad you know this, we we praise uh, barebone software and BB Edit so often. But it's wherever we get the opportunity to praise it with the man himself, like in the chat. And it's part of what I love about BB Edit is that you can see all of the dovetails and all of the dowel jointing and all that like intricate, intricate work that went in so that you have this structure that has been going on for 30 years now. And there's no there's no mystery as to why it is still going on 30 years later is because the craftsmanship and the intention to detail of every last little nut and bolt is absolutely there. And it's such a satisfying thing to be using an app that was built directly for the platform for which it is running. It's not just somebody's project that started off on Linux and then they decided to do a Mac port and then three generations later they decided to unify the code base to make it for X, Y, and Z. It is for a purpose, for a platform, and it fits in there so nice and perfectly that it is it is a joy to, to, to really use that. And that's a hell of a thing to say about a text editor, but with BB Edit, it's absolutely true. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. And it feels great to hear that because it means we did it right. Yeah, <laughs> and you know every everything everything that my colleagues and I have 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 put into it, all of the all of the slings and arrows, all the platform <laughs> transitions, uh, all the all the API churn, the the recent fourteen six update um, had I can't even begin to go into um, the amount of effort that went into just what looks like a tiny feature update. Uh, was that because actually, of Ventura or it was it was motivated by Ventura 
um, the uh, the internal text rendering that we that we were using was an API. Uh, ironically, an API that we were using because 20 years ago, Apple said, stop using this old API and start <laughs> using this new one. 10 years ago, they said, stop using this new one we told you to use 20 years ago and start using this new, new one. Oh, dear. Um, and we said, well, wait a minute, this doesn't do what we need. And how do we make it fast? And they said, well, just do it. <laughs> You're welcome. You're brave because you are so you aren't working in an open environment. So you really do have to it is Apple's way or the highway for anybody developing for Apple. Um, it, it kind of is. And and yeah. then what started happening was um the API that we were using started having performance and reliability problems. Oh um, one of the most frequently encountered symptoms was um folks would upgrade their OS. And suddenly BB Edit would hang on startup because it was waiting for uh, the OS font service. Ugh. Which was hanging. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Just <laughs> stalling at startup. Uh, Not everybody had it happen, but enough had it happen. And it's yeah. like, okay. And they let us know that um, they were going to be officially deprecating the font AP, the old API that we were using. And we said, okay, well, it's time. Let's let's get into this. Let's figure out what it takes. Um, we put some big brains on it, had a couple of breakthroughs, and were able to get it done in advance of, of the OS upgrade. But it was a lot of work and mm. a lot of stress. And and you know the 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 tough thing about it with a product of this old is how do you keep it fresh? and keep and maintain this character of the product that draws right customers to you right, right? um you know how do you how do you make bb edit still be bb edit and that goes to okay well what are the fundamental characteristics char characteristics of product it's fast right it's as andy said dovetailed into the platform and so there's a lot of work involved in keeping up with with what apple's doing who, uh, let me ask you a couple of things. Uh, is it, uh, do you use Xcode or uh, it's Objective-C, I would imagine, since the code base is um, pretty old? So, so there's, there's uh, we do use Xcode because um, uh, it's, there's no choice, in fact. <laughs> uh, right? Okay. If, it's and, free, and this, but there's this no is choice. A, so there you go. Well, well, this is, the, I, I could probably go on for an hour about the state of the developer's full market, but I won't. Um <laughs> Uh, Xcode is the only option if you are de if you are going to be deploying code that runs on any Apple platform, whether it's a watch or a Mac Pro. Uh, mm -hmm. You 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 need to use Apple's toolchain if you are going to build and 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 deploy a is product. That, is that because of notarization? Is that something new? Is that always? I mean, I've written executables in you know Scheme that I can turn into Mac executables just for me. I wouldn't want to distribute it, but I, right. I, you, you, you can, you can build and run executable code using uh, a command line tool chain, right? You can use yeah. homebrew and you can install uh, LLVM and the C to the yeah. C tools yeah. uh, clang. Um, but uh, you're still doing a lot of work by hand. Xcode is, is a build system. It's code signing, notarization, deployment right. to the app store, all of that. And that does make um, it easy unless you don't like uh, Xcode. <laughs> right. And it doesn't matter as you know, it's, it's free, but there's no choice. Uh, well, it actually it's 99 and, bucks a year, but it's r relatively inexpensive. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And, and I, and I miss the days when, when developer tools were expensive and there was real competition in the marketplace. Yeah. No kidding. Um, you used to work for Think, didn't you? I, I did. I used to work for Think. Oh, Think C uh, was so amazing. Mm -hmm. What an amazing yep. tool that was! Oh, I they love that. they they were they were groundbreaking when they came out. I still remember the old ads for for Lightspeed C, as it was called before it was Think C, um, uh, and the tagline was "Make mistakes faster." Yeah, which I, is I love that. For C. And, and, <laughs> yeah, well, and and it, and it really stuck with me, right? It, it's, Your null it's pointers like, you know, execute faster than ever, compile faster than ever. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, and Apple keeps coming out with faster and faster hardware, and you can run an infinite loop in three seconds. Would you be? Um, <laughs> would you be? Would you, would you? That's a programmer's joke. Would you? Uh, would you be interested in moving to Swift, or have you moved some code parts of the code um, base to Swift? So, so there is a small amount of Swift code in in BB Edit. Uh, it was an existing library, and I, I don't remember what it what it does right now. <laughs> as long as it keeps uh, doing it, that's but, not a problem. Um, we are institutionally, uh, at bare bones, we're not institutionally first movers. We're not, yeah. uh, we're not bleeding edge types because, um, reliability is, is what we're all about, right? We're, that's our brand. And, and that really militates against anything, uh, early adoption of any new technology, except for something which we know is going to directly benefit our customers. So when we get to a point where um, adopting more and more Swift code is going to bring some benefit to the product, uh, then yeah, of course we're there. Um, Swift is an interesting development. It is clearly the direction that that Apple's moving in, um, and it, it's sort of it's sort of foolish to say, well, I'm not going to program in Swift ever until I retire. It's like yeah, no. You, <laughs> You don't you don't deny new things. You know, BB Edit was written in Pascal originally. Wow, with with little pieces of C code, and some of the original C is there. The Pascal is long gone now. There's Objective C and a whole pile of C plus plus code and a little bit of Swift. And it's like we use the sure. tools that we need to use to sure. get the job done. That makes sense. Yeah, in yeah. the early days, uh, all Apple development was Pascal. Um, that's where the uh, early days, Mac yeah. programmer workshop was was so great, and that's that's where those sheets, those uh, <laughs> uh, command line yeah. sheets, come from. Um, how who how tell you, you how big is your team? Who who is your team? Let's give them some credit. So so we have we have a small team, and and uh, they're in the all all of the names are in the about box, and there's there's a lot of them. Um, oh well, well they'll let people go to the about box. Yeah, go ahead. it's an excuse to download the app and open the about box. You know, <laughs> there might be a f you, you know you might recognize a name in there. In fact, that's right. You 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 there there are so many names in there. Wow, as Jason says, that's cool. You you might recognize a name. Um, and and yeah, over the history of the product, there have been way too many people to nice. to name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do 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 you have a staff these days? Yes. Uh, we, we have a small staff. We, we keep the office running because we, we do customer service and support. I head up engineering and I supervise a couple of people. Um, but you know, these days we're, we're keeping it at small and lean and flexible. Yeah. And, and you know, as much as I love open source, the next best thing is exactly that is a, a small shop with a committed uh, developer, committed team, uh, that really listens to the uh, customer and has been making a product for a long time. There really is nothing better than that in any sphere because yeah. that's what that's what you really want is this deeply committed uh, developer. Do you want to, Rich, just do this to to the day you kick the bucket? Uh, I, I <laughs> you, you know what? I, I see my customer base getting older, um, and I realize that I'm aging along with them. I would, all things being equal, prefer not to die at my desk. <laughs> but, um, You're young but still. I, but how, old, I, how old are you? I'm in my middle fifties. Oh, you got plenty of time. Um, you got plenty of time. Yeah, and 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 I I still like what I'm doing, even though there are frequently frustrations and stresses. Um, I've been doing this for such a long time, though I can't imagine myself doing anything else. And as long as it's fun, I mean. One of the great things about working on a text editor is there is no shortage of of new ideas. Oh, that's no cool. shortage of of new technologies. No shortage of of things. You know, the uh, the other day it's like, wow, what if it could do? And I started enumerating. I'm like, mind blown. Okay, let me sit down and start sketching this out. Wow, just out of nowhere. Um, and that's the great thing about text, right? It's it's everywhere. Yeah, it's a universal um, format. Although, it's a as universal you know, format, it's a universal expression of everything. In the world of, uh, of of Unix computing, no program is ever done until it can send and receive email. 
So you might want to, yes. you might want to get to work on that. It, it's it, well, you know, we did already. What? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, uh, mail Smith. Yeah. Uh, oh, of, I loved mail Smith. We were sad about mail Smith going away. Yeah. Mail, mail Smith, mail Smith. Well, you can, you can thank Gmail for that. Mm -hmm. Um, mail, mail Smith of, of your, was an expression of Zawinski's law, which, as you said, is, mm -hmm. is no piece of software is done until it, it can send <laughs> and read email. Um, uh, it, uh, Mailsmith um, was built from the BB Edit Foundation. In oh, fact, the two products, the two products shared a, a significant amount of code. Yeah. Uh, and that's that makes sense. Really what it was. It was, yeah. you know, Mailsmith was BB Edit that could send and receive and store email. Hysterical. Uh, so yeah, been there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rich, Rich, I'm I'm, I'm curi curious about what you think of Chat GPT. And when you're going to let Chat GPT write your write your code for well, you? So we we there's some develop some folks that I was you know that in, in the CG area and they started playing with it, getting into like write exporters for them out of Maya, and it sure worked. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 we're seeing you know folks writing whole games you know in it, you know, simple you know stuff. So, so does Copilot. I'm just curious. I mean, Copilot will and, do that. And no, too. but I'm just I'm just curious, like what your opinion is of where AI is going. Just what we have you here. Just, just so, curious to get your two cents. Interesting question. So uh, let me preface this by saying that I have uh, not uh, spent any time with chat GPT. Uh, I have spent a little time with uh, mid journey and Dolly for, for our generation. Right. My, my sense of it is, uh, is that these systems are only as good as their data corpus. And there, I think there's a real possibility of, of sort of, regenerating bad code, if you will. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that I, and, I'm just curious, like, because I, I know a lot of, well, not a lot. I know a couple of developers right now and teams that are using it to brainstorm. So they just sit there and just go, write me this. They don't actually use the code, but they go, oh, that's an interesting way of doing that because the chat GTP, GTP office will come up with some GPT will often come up with something new, like something different than what they expected. Um, in the same way, I've been playing with mid journey probably more than uh -huh. I should. And, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, in, in other than, you know, actually, you know, building Chewbacca, uh, as a robot, um, in the style of Rembrandt, um, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 I, the practical uh, applications, <laughs> very practical <laughs> applications, of, but, but the, um, uh, I, you know, I find that thinking like, if I think about a logo, I, I describe the logo and I get, you know, thousands of them. Do I use any of them? No. Do I take four or five of them and use them as a thought brought thought idea? Absolutely. And I think that, yeah. but I'm just curious what you think about the integration or, or where you think that's going. It, it, it's a valid notion to, to use something like that to explore concepts. I think we're a long way from something being able to replicate the creativity that goes into writing a, a an actual product. Uh, right. Yeah. So I, you know, you could I, do a little I, clips. I, I, I mean, that's what Copilot does very yeah. well by by cribbing from open source projects on on GitHub. Um, <laughs> yeah, and there, that, there's there's, a, there's been job. some controversy about that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but it, you would um, never do a whole. You couldn't do BB editing if you were saying I need a login routine for my website, maybe. But you know, uh, maybe on the other hand, um, you know, is is there a uh, is there a day coming where you could you could say to chat GPT, why don't they come up with a better name? Uh, <laughs> they will. Uh, it's $3 million we're, we're, a day to run it. They're, they're, that won't, it's not, we're a little <laughs> way off from it being a uh, user, user product. Right. But, you know, it's, and I think we're way off from saying, you know, write me a text editor or yeah. write me a spreadsheet. Yeah. It's more uh, like a routine though. Like write me this, yeah. something will do this. Uh -huh. and, and I could see, I was just thinking about it with BB edit. I could see it being something like there's a window, a chat GPT window open. Mm -hmm. And you say, just ask it like, write this. And it would just give me some text. I may not use it. Or I may cut and paste no, parts of it. I mean, you know, you, yeah. Copilot's uh -huh. exactly that. You would be typing along. I, well, 
my, my, I mean, my, one of my favorite things with BB Edit is just simply I've got this big text file that is munged up. I need to I need to sort it out so I can use it as input for something. Like if there were chat GPT, as you, uh, BB Edit has wonderful helpers uh, for uh, regular expressions. It'd be great if there was if the the way that I would love to see chat GPT or something like that would be I would simply say, yeah, take this file and every time you see the word banana with two semicolons and then a hyphen after it, uh, change it to mango, but not if it's at the start of a line and that's what out, grip like, is for what? thanks to bb edit i know exactly how to do that <laughs> and, the, and the next thing you know <laughs> right you 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 ask chat gpts that says you know write me a regular expression that that does this and the next thing you know you're getting a phone call from some angry sysadmin over there because you <laughs> actually brought uh, the whole thing down one of the best uses for both copilot and chat gpt is giving it really obscure arcane regexes and it will tell you what it does which is you know that's nice i mean you can do that on a mm -hmm. website too but that's nice um rich we're i want to take a break uh, you you're more than welcome to stick around i think there's a african blue that needs feeding i guess i don't know uh <laughs> norwegian blue <laughs> norwegian blue yeah. African gray, but African gray, whatever. Yeah, I don't know. African I don't know parrots. It's a parrot, man. Know, it's parrots. a parrot. I don't know parrots. I do notice they though, are. the chat room has noticed that you have a lovely bottle of poop remover over your right <laughs> shoulder. I try never to get it on myself. <laughs> uh, and a number of people in the chat room were amazed to know such a thing exists. <laughs> so Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Uh, poop off, bird. See, now if I knew that it exists, I might actually consider a bird. Oh, yeah. It's it's great for, for cleaning up uh, bird cages and so forth. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry about that sun in my face. No, that's fine. We're I'm going to let you go because I, I, I don't want to slow down the progress for a, for a BB Edit 15. We got we to gotta keep working on that. I'm going to go write a chat GPT bot now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Very good. Hey, a real pleasure. Rich Siegel, everybody who uses a Mac, I don't know why you wouldn't have a copy of Bare Bones on it, uh, BB Edit it's on it. It's free. It's it, yes. free. It, it, you it get is. almost, it you is. get you basically can... the, the text wrangler version of BB Edit for free. And then, of course, uh, you will soon pay for it. And pretty soon you'll be paying Rich every couple of years for an update because it's worth it. <laughs> You know. It's worth it. And Rich, we want to keep B you writing. That's really the truth of it. Yeah. B Thank BB edit BB edit on your on your Mac is like having Italian dressing somewhere in your cupboard. Buy it. <laughs> At some point you will definitely use it. You'll be, and you'll be you'll glad, be glad you'll you have it. Handy. <laughs> okay, you can use it's a, it's a it's not as good as it it, it's, it sucks less, but it's you know, it still doesn't suck, but uh, that's pretty good. You could use that for a slogan. It's uh, it's uh, a nice idea. Nice it's idea Italian like dressing that. for your computer. Merry, Merry Christmas. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Merely paying a fraction of it forward, Rich. <laughs> and, to, and to all of you, have a great holiday. Have a great holiday, Rich. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Rich. Uh, Thanks, it's Rich. always a pleasure to talk to you. You are our uh, local expert, and uh, we're very grateful for what you do. And I hope you have a wonderful holiday. Thank you. You can put the All sock back well. on the microphone. No, <laughs> no mating occurred, I'm happy to say. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. You, you know, I, I think they can't hear me, which is part of, they can't hear you, which is part of why they're not, not over here. Ah, yeah, they'd be a Well, you know what, if somebody, if you want a cameo, I can arrange it. Yeah, let's Leo see. Leo is see. the Barry White okay. of, of, the, of see, the bird community. Let's see the Norwegian blue or the African gray or whatever it is. Is there such a thing as a Norwegian blue, or is that just a money bike? That's, that's, that's from the parrot sketch. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, isn't isn't she? Oh, she's this molting is, a little is, bit. This is Bruno, and, and he, uh, he 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 picks at his feathers a bit, oh. so he always looks is, a little bit a little is, bit raggedy. Is Bruno a rescue? A rescue He's not. Parrot? Okay. Um, no, he he has just always been kind of an anxious bird, and yeah. very young he developed this habit of. Of barbering his feathers. Oh, no, because I, I know like a lot of parrots uh, when they peck, when they pull their feathers, a lot of it's because of the stress, not the right environment, yeah. and so like a lot of times they can be associated as rescue birds. That so. voice I should explain yeah. is John Ashley, who's the board yeah. the, running the board, but apparently um, has a fascination with parrots. Which I grew is, up with seven birds. Oh, there you go. I All was right. like I was like okay. Josh. <laughs> yeah, we that's used to, we used that's to a, a guy. that's yeah. a lot of that's a lot of birds. Yep. How um, old? Yeah, how old he, is Bruno? Um, Bruno is. Uh, 15. 15. But they live along, they yep. could outlive you, right? They will probably outlive, with, outlive me. Wow. 
and he's uh, he's wondering who I'm talking to right now. He has he's because he can't. They're smart. Yeah. He said, I, "Why why is Daddy oh, talking to oh. himself?" Yeah, they yeah. he they're they're crazy smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're a good boy, aren't you? Oh, and then and then he's got. They really look uh, like baby dinosaurs. They really do. When you see oh, yeah. when you see yeah. him that way, teacup just, dinosaurs. Yeah, you like can Paris Hilton. We have yeah. purse sized dinosaurs. Yeah, you can. We, really. we have we have. We have turkey, wild turkeys go by our house, and I'm like, wow, that looks a lot like a yeah. velociraptor. Yeah, <laughs> and, this, and, the, and this is and this is Tater. Hi, Tater. Um, and she's a year older than Bruno, Aww. and she's beautiful. Uh, she she's she's a little princess. Yeah. <laughs> and she, and uh, and she's got a very different disposition. Yeah. Uh, she doesn't she doesn't talk, but she makes a lot of a lot of noises. And yeah, if you ever needed to, if you ever wondered about that relationship between birds and dinosaurs look at those claws. You know, all you got is all you got to do is look at her feet yeah yeah <laughs> and it's like oh yeah oh yeah clever girl oh here you come <laughs> all right all right gotta get the whole family on on camera uh, well they they've developed a they've learned the trick of climbing down off the cage and coming over to my chair oh there you go <laughs> Aren't they precious? Rich, I, I'm sorry. It's four calling birds. Four calling four birds. Four calling birds. Where's the Excuse French hen? Collie birds, not calling. Is it really, not, Andy? Is it really it calling is actually, birds? They, uh, basically, dark colored birds is the original. Oh. Sa same reason why you, you call a, a, certain dogs a collie. See, I believe him because he's wearing Vincent Van Gogh's hat right now. So Exactly. You see, <laughs> I wear it for respect. And it's working. Rich Siegel. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank Always you. a pleasure Happy having holidays. you on barebones.com. Thanks, Rich. You must go there now and get a copy for free. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> Our show today, we'll come back with more. There are some stories this week. Not many. <laughs> That's why I'm glad we could, uh, we could consume an hour of the show with talking to Rich. Always a pleasure. Our show today brought to you by Adagy. Now, let me tell you something. If you work in a, uh, a shop of any kind, that has Apple gear, you need Adigy, A-D-D-I-G-Y. It helps you do more than just manage your Apple devices. It's the only fully cloud-based, multi-tenant Apple MDM platform designed for scalability. Did you get all that? You get the features, the functionality, the flexibility you need to customize and manage your Apple devices the way you want. You can ensure your Apple infrastructure is optimized to best support your environment and help your team be as productive as possible every day with Adigy. Adigy helps simplify Apple IT management by creating a solution that's so flexible, so customizable, any IT team can use it to easily maintain and secure the Apple devices in their managed networks. Adigy helps you ensure every Apple device, Macs, iPhones, iPads, secure, supported, ready to scale. What makes Adigy different? Zero-touch deployment. You can get new members onboarded securely in under five minutes. You'll love, by the way, you'll love the, uh, the concierge platform with live agent capabilities. That is, that's going to offload a lot of work for you. Secure authentication with trusted providers means you eliminate security gaps with tested, authenticated features that your users can rely on. You get real-time device monitoring. And you can resolve issues automatically. Automated remediation before there's downtime. Instantly. Of course, completely custom compliance features because everybody has different needs. But you will love knowing your Apple infrastructure is compliant and up-to-date always. I love the self-service capabilities. That means your IT team is you know, saved from endless reset requests with 24-7 user access to resources and applications, you get patch management uh, without, you know, zero touch patch management, which is wonderful. You can prevent delays, fix bugs early, minimize downtime, roll out new updates and patches ASAP. It's easy to customize, easy to scale to meet any need, adapt to any environment with fast, free, catered migration. It's an MDM tool that works as hard as you do at the speed of now. If you've got Apple in your estate, you need Adigy. Go to Adigy.com slash twit to start your free 14-day trial. Adigy.com slash twit. One user says, we're able to tap into economies of scale and optimize common tasks for all client environments. We estimate this reduces our time, the time the team dedicates to MDM management, but at least 30% every week. That means happier team members, happier users, 
It allows us to more effectively secure our managed endpoints. Get started today with Adagy's award-winning support. When you partner with Adagy, you get white glove support from a team of experts who live, eat, and breathe Apple. They care about your success as much as you do. It's a better way to do your MDM on your Apple devices. Guarantee Apple success with Adagy. Start your 14-day free trial at addigy.com slash twit. And by the way, if you buy before the end of the year, before December 31st, 10% off your first year. That's their holiday gift to you. So don't wait. Visit adigy.com slash twit today. Little programming note. This is our last show of 2022. Next week, next Tuesday, is the best of Mac Break Weekly. And then we will be back here uh, doing the show uh, live and in person in the new year on, what is that, January? Let me look at my calendar. I have to make sure. January 4th? 3rd. 3rd. January 3rd. We'll be here. It'll be the first show of the new year, actually, for me. Uh, looking forward to it. We have our best of uh, start uh, on Monday for the whole week for all of the shows. So, actually, I, 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 Rich might have had something to say about this. I'm going to, uh, there is a um, new report of a jailbreak or a, I guess, a, um, a, a, a gateway manager break, gatekeeper break, uh, reported by Microsoft researcher, security researcher Jonathan Barr Orr, the security flaw, and you got to have a good name these days if you're going to have a security flaw, is Achilles, uh, CVE 2022-42821. Now, don't worry, it's been fixed. This is responsible disclosure from Microsoft. They told Apple, Apple fixed the vulnerability. Uh, it allowed attackers to deploy malware on vulnerable Mac OS devices, bypassing Gatekeeper. So Gatekeeper normally checks downloaded software from the internet. And the way it does it, I didn't, this is actually kind of interesting. Uh, Apple, when something is downloaded from the internet, sets the com.apple.quarantine attribute. Microsoft does something similar. We've talked about on Windows Weekly called the Mark of the Web. Actually, Steve has also talked about it in security now. So that quarantine app attribute for downloads tells Apple, okay, you know, you, you got to let people know you got to, that's where you see that pop up. You got it from the internet. You sure you want to open this? It checks. It will block, uh, Gatekeeper will block it if it's not appropriately signed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Achilles flaw involves specially crafted payloads that abuse a logic issue to set restrictive ACL permissions that block web browsers and internet downloaders from setting the quarantine attribute. These uh, would be archived as zip files. The payload would be archived as a zip file. The malicious app within the archive then launches on the target system, will not get blocked by gatekeepers, so it's an easy way to download and deploy malware. It's, this means you don't, you know, they don't have to have access to your machine if you download something malicious. So you want to make sure you have Mac OS Ventura updated, I guess 13, what is it, 13.1, 13.2, um, 12.6.2 for Monterey, 172 for Big Sur. Those all came out last week. That was part of that big download uh, update. 11. It's nice. They go two versions back. So you're, yeah, you're, exactly. even if you're running oh, Big Sur, yeah, love there's a security yeah, update for that. Yeah. So if you want to. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is actually a reinforcement, too, of what we were talking about earlier, which is Apple has built over the last few years on the Mac this whole system for checking software outside the App Store. And this is trying to get around it, but they do have this whole system where they're looking at your, on first launch, they're looking at the software and they're checking it against, you know, is it signed, which means it hasn't been modified. Um, and it's a known signature from Apple and they know who the developer is. And like, there are all these structures that Apple's put in place that are not uh, in the app store, but that they're still trying to keep Mac users safe. Yeah, that, that's that's why even though I absolutely insist that I should be able to sideload any app I want on a Mac, uh, because that's what makes it a desktop, uh, the fact that there's also there's a middle ground where, look, we'll let you install any app you want. We will let developers sign an app so that we can pull that we can pull that certification at any time. If it turns out that there's malware uh, associated with it, uh, which is the best of both worlds, where I, uh, a developer, I can I can download software from a developer who doesn't necessarily have to play by App Store rules. Nonetheless, if it turns out that their code got hijacked or if they were malicious actors to begin with. 
Apple themselves can basically pull the plug. Or or I can be an idiot and simply say, no, no, no. I'll, here's an ice cream cone that I found in the middle of the sidewalk. I'm just going to pick it up and lick it myself. That, that's bad, but there's a good, there's, I like that there's a middle ground. That, good article that uh, by Lawrence, Lawrence Abrams at uh, bleepingcomputer.com if you want to see the video uh, of the exploit. He also points out that Bar Orr uh, has a uh, good track record of naming exploits. He was the guy who discovered the uh, system integrity protection bypass last year called Shrootless. <laughs> 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 Power Dur, a bug that allows attackers to bypass transparency, consent, and control. He's actually obviously he's a Microsoft researcher, but he's working hard uh, to find these uh, flaws, and I'm sure Apple's very appreciative of it. Of it, he also uh, 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 I don't know if he discovered it, but Apple did fix a zero day Mac OS vulnerability last year called Schlayer. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, these bypasses are pretty quickly exploited. Schlayer was actually uh, exploited. So um, it's important. This is why you we tell you get the updates uh, as soon as they're available. And at least, you know, in, in recent memory, Apple's updates have all been uh, safe uh, and reliable. Yes? I don't, I can't yeah. think of an issue. They, they do a good job of beta testing it, which is not, I can't quite say that for Microsoft. And their security updates, too, are actually, they've got a, even a new rapid security update system that they're using now. So they know the, the importance of if there's a, a big bug out there of being able to push a, a, a fix out as soon as possible, especially if it's a zero day. Yeah. Alex uh, is having fun with mid-journey. I, I would love to get your, uh, what was it, the, the Wookiee if robot? You put it on Twitter. From the future. Well, I have your, I have your minions in, from Roman times. I have yeah I have the the, minion, the the one before that was the the uh yeah it it is um you know they uh it's gotten a little Oh there out he of is. Hand. There, there he is. is. He's, Chewbacca he's there, the uh the futuristic we've, robot wookie. We we found that it was well and and what was funny was is that we you know we started playing with there's there's the Chewbacca there and in the style um, of Rembrandt by the way. But we did <laughs> but I also did in the style of uh HR Giger, oh wow. uh, which was a little little darker, too creepy than, than the first one, <laughs> and then and then someone in, on Twitter Ooh, that uh, is said, creepy. "What about what about Picasso?" And I was like, "Okay, robot, robot wow. in 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 Picasso." And then what happened was, is a bunch of us were sitting around. There was a Christmas party last week um, between a bunch of folks that were at ILM and um, at, that. the, at the so building cool. that I'm in. And so they, we started throwing stuff out, and so that's why we had a bunch of Star Wars things. But we had um, so we we did Princess Leia as a robot in the style of Rembrandt and we got, Oh my, <laughs> kind of looks like Stacy Higginbotham on a, uh, oh, on a, yeah. on a good day. And, and then, and then we, I, all I typed in for this one was, it doesn't do text very well, but all I typed in, uh, if you're familiar with the meme of this is fine, uh, yeah. you know, this is fine with the, the whole, yeah. whole place is on fire. Yeah. So I just typed in, this is, imagine this is fine. And I just get, this is fine. Woo, this is fine. <laughs> a little, little card, a little, this is fine card. And then of course you saw the, 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 the I, I've, for some place. reason I've, I have found that Mid Journey plus um, uh, Minions is hilarious. I have I, I'm building. I may build a whole book that, of course, I can't copyright. Um, that is uh, that is just just a whole book of Minions through through time. You know, so I have Minions climbing uh, thing. Minions uh, is crossing the Delaware. Minions in World War II on D Day. Minions I'm like I just keep on putting them in. And um, and then this one, one more, Leo, just for Colleen Henry and I were hanging out. Um, oh, give her did. my love, by the way. I will. Our I will. first, we're, we're, our first uh, studio manager and engineer, and who she designed was, all I'll, of the stuff that we use in one form or another, still to this day. I, I was at Colleen's, and we were we were doing. It and she says, "I want a tactical Snorlax." Co Colleen, as you know, loves Snorlaxes. <laughs> so here's your here's your tactical. That's a tactical, tactical Snorlax, Snorlax. already. <laughs> Snorlaxes are so a Pokemon anyway, type. Is juggernaut. she still at Facebook or was she? Uh, was she's she, still there. She's still there. Because I know, okay. I know the uh, she worked on the portal and the portal was discontinued. I was wondering if. She uh, works on a lot of things. She works on other things too. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so she works on a lot of things there. She's her, her uh, yeah, she's tied into a lot of things. She's there. the queen of streaming. Yeah. Uh, wow, cool. Are you using MidJourney locally or are you using their Discord? How are you? I have it on Discord. Discord In, on yeah. Discord, it is. It's just awesome. Yeah. You know, like you it's just, fast, you know, and it's, it's I, I pay 50 bucks a month. So I pay 30 right. to have the whatever standard it's and free I to pay try 20 and, to be private. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. But, but I probably produce a couple hundred images a day. <laughs> okay. 
it's like it's, it just it just kind of pumps out. Um, the you have enough hardware. Version three you four. could run stable diffusion locally. I'm sure you have a machine that would be very uh, good at it. I've, I have stable diffusion. Oh, okay. Um, you and like I find better. that I like mid journey. So stable diffusion is better if you want to train it to do something or you want it to you want to point it at something. Um, the but mid journey I think produces more pleasing images, and and I don't do it for any reason other than I entertain myself. Someone will say something funny, and I'll go. You oh, I wonder what that would look like it. if I. Like, or if I think of something, I just throw it. I have it open almost all, chat GPT and mid journey room open on two windows on my computer all the time. And I just, I am musing. I just finished um, literally before the show, I finished the Osh soup that I made, the Afghani Osh soup <laughs> that was generated by chat GPT. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I literally uh, just said, I need a good Osh soup and um, recipe. And it gave it to me and I made it on Sunday and the family devoured it very nice. quickly. It was supposed to last nice. all week, but it was too popular. We, uh, we used, uh, Anthony Nielsen used Stable Diffusion to create our holiday card, which you should get if you haven't already gotten it. You should get it pretty soon. Uh, Here's a picture look, of it. it uh, he, we took a picture out in front of the studio, and then uh, he used Stable Diffusion to turn the uh, studios into a gingerbread house with candy oh. cane twit <laughs> and icing. Uh, and, and it's hard to do that without monging us, uh, but he managed to somehow preserve our faces most of us look about right i think in this picture yes <laughs> that's great that's great no burke really does look like that uh and and i think he added a sweater to uh lily his uh, burke's dog our studio uh security guard was was lily wearing that i don't think she was no good job anthony if you are on the uh twit christmas card mailing list you will get your copy soon that is the team as constituted in 2020 Two more security uh, news. It, it just never stops, does it? Uh, let's see. Apple continues to test its new rapid security response updates. Uh, this time, see? yeah, see. <laughs> what, what what do you mean? See, that's what I said. They're, they've got a whole new system now for emergency updates. Yeah. Does it go gauga? Well, <laughs> not yet. I mean, maybe. Wouldn't that be great if it did? Oh man, let's get on that. Let's file a radar on that one. So if you have 16.2, you will see, uh, is this in the system pref? Sorry. What do they call it now? Control panel? Settings? Settings. Settings. <laughs> is this in settings? It looks like it, it is under software update. Under automatic updates, you will see if there is one, a security response is available. Re apply now. And uh, so this is... I don't know if this is out. 13.2a, is that real? Or is that just an example of it? Well, they've been doing some testing, right? Uh -huh. Like, in fact, during the 13.1 beta process, there was a period where there were, and, and the iOS 16.2, uh, uh, process, there was a, uh, like, test where you'd get a thing that says, this is an emergency test, right? <laughs> the test of the emergency broadcasting system where you would basically say, okay, and it wouldn't do anything. But they have been working on this because they want to be able to push out a rapid OS update of you know just for uh security stuff so if you're using the public beta which i take it you are uh jason you will have you might see this update it is not yet out it will come out uh in uh 16 yeah, it's in go ahead it's in ios 16.2 but it's oh, okay. now going to be rolled out in the next mac os 13.2 so it's in beta for mac os but already out on ios uh in the latest update oh good so ios iphones will get the rapid update now but the mac will get as it will watch os and tv os that'll be a little alarming if you're watching you know uh mr robot and all of a sudden <laughs> <laughs> pops up well, geez, uh, you mr. Wanna... robot <laughs> i'm in the show now oh no no it's, this is good right i mean apple's gotten so much i mean i know you've you've covered it on all your shows like a apple has definitely gotten a lot of pushback about some of their the conflict between Apple's development cycle and their way of disclosing things or, you know, lack of disclosure um, versus what the security community feels like they should be doing. And this feels like one of those examples of Apple saying, yeah, you're right. We need to be better at this than we've been and trying to create a whole new uh, streamlined system for emergencies. Scooter X is now confirming that the dog was naked during the live streamed photo shoot. So... I think you were looking a little too closely, Scooter X. Mm. He remembers that. <laughs> Must have taken a picture near the end of the holiday party. <laughs> Sad, really? Uh, it's over, or, well, at least uh, it looks like it might be over. I, You know, I hate 
reporting rumors unless they come from well-sourced experts in the area. I think that Mark Gurman, it's not even a rumor. What is? Yeah, these are reports. Reports. These are, you know, yeah, yeah. Was was Je this is from Dylan Byers, who is absolutely well connected in the media world. Uh, in his uh, our, uh, newsletter at, in Puck uh, dot News, he says Apple and the NFL have parted ways that it's over yeah. in the negotiations for the NFL Sunday ticket. It was taking a long time. The yeah, and Go Google and Amazon are more of a are, are more likely to be still talking to the NFL. I think it was a hard match for Apple because, as we have talked about here in previous weeks, Apple kind of wanted this to be a product that the NFL didn't want it to be. It kind of is a legacy product that they created 15 years ago for Directv that doesn't entirely make sense. Right? It's like U.S. only, and it doesn't include local games it's only the ones that are not local and like it's not a great fit for apple's strategy but it is being in business with the nfl which is is it, show me that you're serious about sports right is being in business in the with the nfl in the united states so i think that that's why they kept talking but all the reports about the behind the scenes negotiations suggest apple really wanted this to be a product that it's not and the nfl didn't really want to change it because they know that somebody will buy it as is for a couple of billion dollars and you know it it may make more sense for amazon or or for youtube tv actually is an interesting yeah. connection because they already will have your locals on offer plus they can roll in sunday ticket and that's an interesting idea too so somebody somebody's going to pay the nfl uh, a few billion to take this off their hands for a few years it's expensive direct tv pays a billion and a half a year so yeah and it's I, not you know. it is the customer revenue will never match it the reason you do it is because you want to get those customers in your door to do something else, to sign up for YouTube TV or to yes. sign up for Amazon Prime Video, right? Or, or for Prime. Here's like those are the reasons you pay. Otherwise, they do it. Otherwise, they'd roll this into their NFL Plus service and they just take the money directly. But they know somebody will overpay for it in order to fuel some other uh, some other service that they're selling. Here's what Dylan and, uh, writes, and I think this is, he, again, he's very expert in this. It's one of the reasons I subscribe to Puck News. Live sports rights really are the great X factor in this whole equation. The declining linear business, that's that's cable TV uh, and, and broadcast networks, is being kept aloft by sports, mainly the NFL and college football, which account for the most watched programs every single week in the fall. But it's a terrible deal for broadcasters because leagues have all the leverage. That's what Apple has learned, right? So they have to spend increasingly astronomical sums to rent, rent content that, that they almost never recoup. Football's always been a loss leader. Media companies pay for the rights on Sunday so they can market a week's worth of programming and pick up the revenue there. But these economics are becoming less favorable for legacy broadcasters as the audience for primetime sitcoms and morning TV shrinks. What can they do? They've never needed sports mo more, but the companies that can afford to pay... Those sky-high prices are, of course, the big tech firms. So with each new round of rights negotiations, we're going to see Apple, Amazon, and Google take a greater slice of the pie while legacy media companies get boxed out. Uh, and, and this, is where he, this is where he said, I'm now told that Apple, once seen as a front-runner for the rights, is also backed out of these negotiations. Not because they can't afford it, but because they don't see... The logic, I had heard that one of the sticking points was Apple wanted to give it away free to Apple TV yeah. Plus subscribers and that the NFL... I don't believe that. Don't believe that for a minute. Yeah. NFL wouldn't No, because they, they're that. not even doing that for MLS. They're not even giving away the MLS right. stuff. For Just free. parts they're of it, right? going to make you pay for it. Yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. believe that part of it. But I do okay. I do believe the, 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 the Dylan's report here that it doesn't make sense for Apple. I think, I think that's probably true. I think Apple really kind of thought the value of being in business with the NFL, but they could never kind of figure out how that would actually, you know, the money they would spend would come back to them in goodness. Right. And I, 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 can, I can see that. And yeah. it's, it's a bit of a technological quagmire, you know, the NFL, I mean, general. And so, you know, Amazon really got the best deal because Thursday Night Football is something that's one show. They can have more impact on it. They can have more control. They can do a lot of other things. So Amazon's able to start, you know, they're going to be able to continue to evolve that, that, that one product dealing with all of the locations and all of the stuff and the requirement to go back to 1080p and the, uh, or 1080i back to you know, 1080i for, for broadcasters, all of those things really bogged down the whole, the whole thing. And, and so I think it's going to be really, um, 
uh, it's going to be really interesting. I, I think actually, you know, it's it's a, unfortunately they're probably not going to be able to rest the way Monday night football. Monday night football is, it's funny. It, 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 I watched a little bit of it last night and mostly because I was crossing over something else. And I realized the Manning brothers were sitting there just talking about the show what I really yeah, found interesting about that. You watched the that, wrong stream. <laughs> no, you watched the right stream. <laughs> really? The Manning Catch right is the best. No, is it? So no, Manning, I hate it. Brothers, I love it. I love so, it. Okay. The, I, I feel like I, I hadn't seen the man. So when they came on at first, it was horrible. Like it was, it was just watching That's one long train wreck. cringy as hell, yeah. It, and, and, and what they're doing is they're reducing the number of third party people coming in and they're reducing all the goofy things the producers added. Oh, and okay. they're just letting two Talk. pro level, like well, Tony right. Romo style. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, is they're not talking like broadcasters. They literally are two brothers who've been playing quarterback. They're trash the talking. Yeah. No, 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 no. They, they were Sometimes. trash. But, but what I caught <laughs> trash talk each other a lot. The, they do. But the moment there was, there was like a solid half an hour where you listen to quarterbacks who played yeah. in the National Football League listen, for twenty years, yeah. talking about. Well, it, it was funny because they're sitting there going. Oh, you just want to do, it, 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 Eli was just like, you just want to do a, a long curl there. It'll just, you know, it, they'll, they'll pull it out. And the next play, long, long curl. curl. Like, and, and, yep. and, and he goes, well, and, and he, but what he did is he started talking about the defense. Watch what happens with the defense. They're doing it. The, and he's reading it like he would a quarterback, oh, like Tony cool. Romo. But I love Tony Romo, Romo for with, that reason. Without, yeah, yeah. without all the pomp and circumstance of yeah. just two people talking, two people who really know what they're doing talking back and forth. And I was like, I don't ever want to go back to, I don't even know if I can watch a football broadcast after that. Like it was, and then of course they brought two other people in and it became super cringy. And again. then it becomes a podcast and it's no good. Yeah, And you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> just let these two guys geek out yeah. for the whole show. And you don't need, the thing is, is you're spending way too much money on the production because I was like, all I have to do is watch that. And, you know, um, and so I think that we're going to start seeing more innovation, you know, in that area because with MLS, Apple could give you one stream that is the, broadcast announcer version and another screen where there's a bunch of soccer players talking about what's actually happening. And, you know, it's, they're going to have a lot more flexibility. You Amazon's know, I think doing that, the same thing. They have, I think feels like they have a dozen <laughs> separate uh, multiple layers. Yeah. Layers. Oh, do they? I haven't, can, I haven't actually seen on their Thursday yeah, there's night like a football. comedy layer. And then yeah, got there's the, daisies and there's, Oh, the, it's crazy. And then there's the, like the Susie Colber. And, there's two women. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't know that they had so many streams. I have, I have a really good layer. So I, 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 I didn't, I didn't know. They're working they, on it. They, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, Apple's really committed to sports, but I think this NFL thing didn't line up for them and they'll, they'll find somebody like the NFL. I mean, people outside the U S may not understand this, but it, like, like that thing that you read, Leo, like it's just, this is the biggest thing on TV is football. It's the only America. thing keeping TV alive in America. Yeah. Now, yeah. And, and, and I don't think it is going to end up being linear versus streaming because what we found with a lot of these, and I think this is smart, is the idea is that even when the streaming gets it, they often will then license some of the shows like Apple. Apple got all the MLS games, but there will be some MLS games going back to broadcast. In fact, that deal just got signed, and they'll be just—they'll essentially be rebroadcasting the stuff that Apple is streaming, but they'll be doing on a on a linear channel. And I think we're going to start to see that. There's a rumor that uh, there's a college football conference, the Pac-12, that is uh, negotiating with Amazon. One rumor is that they might sell their whole package to Amazon, and people are like. Wow, they're they're not going to be on linear TV, and it's like no, because probably what will happen is that Amazon is they will take a little carve out of games and sell it to like CBS or something. Well, but and, but because there are uh, there are audiences on both on streaming and linear, and you can make more money by selling it uh, twice or sub licensing it to linear from streaming. Well, the other thing is, is Pac-12 has so they have all the football games that that we're used to seeing, and that still has broadcast trucks, and that's still going out to broad you know to to linear TV. But Pac-12 does something like 2,200 or 2,500 other games. Yeah, the Olympic and the, sports and other uh, and other stuff. Yeah, and exactly. all that other stuff from all those and all and all the Title IX stuff is all all runs through. And what they do is, and they they are the perfect partner for because Pac-12 is in um, in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco, and they use Internet two and fiber to bring all of the show all the shows back. So they they Remy what we call Remy. It's remote remote um, pro broadcast. They bring all of those cameras back to to their facility, and they have all their replays. They sometimes the announcers, uh, all the playbacks, everything else are all happening in one place. So if you're gonna stream something, um, it is the perfect because you don't have to deal with all the. It, they've already figured out how to deal with all of those venues right. and, and all the, stream, the process. And most of these streamers don't have their own production facilities, so they make a deal and it's use their production huge. facility too. Well, and, so this is it's going to be really interesting to watch, right? Like yeah. this idea of. Is it pure streaming 
or is it streaming with some broadcast? Uh, right. Because there's probably more money and more audience to be found with like streaming plus broadcast oh, in yeah. sports. Because They're, because Dylan Byers' story is exactly right. It's like, what do the networks do if the only thing people watch is sports, but the price has gotten to be so high that they can't make any money on sports? Yeah. Uh, there's also a, <laughs> we've talked about this before. Maybe this is why you get the the, the Manning brothers and, and uh, the, there's the one with LeBron James called The Shop on Thursday Night Football. Maybe that's why they're doing it because there's a, there is a dearth of good play-by-play -play announcing uh, out there. <laughs> it, it, it we saw that off. with Friday Night it Baseball. super fast. So Real Saturday, fast. the NFL had three games with some of the worst play-by-play -play announcing I've ever heard in my and life. And if you had NFL Sunday Ticket, you'd know about all those announcers because you'd see them on their games, but oh, instead they my. hide them in the small market. They should hide yeah. them. Yeah, this is when I was a kid. I don't know about you guys, but like one of the, the in the future was in the future. You'll watch sports and you'll be able to choose what announcer or camera you could. Right. And I was like, wow, that'll be amazing. And it's like they're almost there. Right. They're almost yeah. there because once you're streaming, other than the cost of hiring announcers. Right. The idea that you could you could get, pick up more viewers by giving them different takes on that broadcast. And that's why, like, I, I watch the Manning cast only when it's the two brothers. And then I flip yeah, over when exactly. when they get their guests in there because it's terrible. But um, I, I think it's really fun. And then uh, ESPN has done their stat cast thing that they do occasionally where they've got yeah. like the, Amazon the, the, does the dummies in the main. Yeah, the yeah. dummies in the main booth. And then ESPN had like smart people in a second booth where they're like, OK, Okay, nerds, you want to listen to smart people talk. Okay, <laughs> we'll do that for you. And I love that broadcast a lot. What is so it all? Like, Ezra I, like, I really like this idea. Like, <laughs> and if you're ESPN, no, he had like, you already paid for the rights. chance of making that pass. But for the college football championship, they always do the mega cast for that, too. And the idea is like ESPN and Disney, they already bought the rights, they buy it one time, they've got four channels. Why not do four versions of the same show? Because nobody else is going to be watching. You know well, what are the what are you putting bowling on ESPN two? No, I, you're not going to do that. So I like I like this idea, and I think streaming is the perfect place for it. Well, and I think that the the problem for for linear broadcast is that they that the when you experience something, a lot of times it poisons your mind towards whatever was there before if it was great. So like the Manning thing, for the time that I saw the Man Mannings just talk without any guests because they're not hosts, they're just geeky quarterbacks it's like you're sitting and on the couch were, with two really smart oh my gosh like guys. you were it's a different football game it's a different football game to listen to them yeah. talk about the defenses and what look at no, what it's like, true they're noticing like what the cornerback's doing see how that cornerback he's giving him a lot of space you can throw seven or eight this is like there was a, you can throw seven or eight yard passes all day they just don't think you'll be patient enough to just keep doing it you know and 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 just the this this wide knowledge and they'll tell you like when they go over to the side they're saying here's the conversation they're having they're talking about what hash oh, mark to be that. at what to you know like in there and they're and, and i don't I need the rest of the playback oh my gosh yeah. it, it i will i apologize i apologize in advance every time they bring guests on or they do anything other than talk about football yeah it's horrible <laughs> that, that's um, why but, i stopped watching it was the shtick know. and you yeah, know it's totally totally getting you, out of you get the of idea that producers that, like, who say nobody likes football let's do some shtick that's not right that's and, not why and they do that with sunday night baseball too but like yeah the idea of people who are experts in their field watching Somebody like it was Aaron Rodgers last night, right? So it's like two, two Super Bowl winning quarterbacks watching yeah. another Super Bowl yeah. winning quarterback and talking about Shoot. what makes him great. Wish I'd oh man, that's I love I love that stuff. That By is the, way, the best, right? We in chess, we've chess we've always done that. They never have commentators who aren't grandmasters when you're commentating right. a chess match. I know it's not that exciting, but <laughs> but we did. I did. I did a bunch of streams of of basketball as a test, and we did 26 events, and we had pro a pro basketball yeah, player commentating on it and talking about it and we gave him a telestrator and stuff like that that's the color guy right. though right you have a play-by-play -play, no, who's a professional on that but, sir but there was no play-by-play -play. we weren't being interrupted oh. the problem with basketball is there's too much talking because yeah, yeah, everything's yeah. happening constantly right so he was just talking in general and you're watching the oh, game much like, i know what's happening in the game much better and he's just talking about the things that you have to do and here's what they're going to have to make this is what they're doing with me clock management and this is what what they were doing with the offense yeah. and here look at what they're doing here and suddenly I went from, I don't understand basketball to like, oh, this is really, I mean, now you can see all the things happening, you know, that are, that are there. And I think that it's pretty, uh, I think that this is the future. And I think that, I think that you're definitely going to start seeing more and more of these, like, and, and the problem is you won't be able to go back to linear. Can you'll I go, tell you, you'll go back this, and is, be like, this is, uh, this is why this is happening is because linear, I know having worked for tech TV for years, <laughs> doesn't trust the audience. They've been taught right. so long that you oh, yeah. should dumb it down, dumb it down, dumb it down. So they make content for people who aren't interested in the content. And and I kept trying to tell Tech TV, 
go the other way. ESPN yeah. does. Go the other way. Make content for people who really love whatever it is they're watching right. and put experts in there. You know, Football for people who don't like football it's seems terrible. like a misstep, right? <laughs> right? Like a misstep there. But that's what we were doing on Tech TV, and and uh, and it's what Linear does because they've been taught for so long not to trust the audiences and tell them. Well, they they only have one pipe for a long time. Linear right. built was you built no up choice. with I only have one pipe, it's and I'm bringing as many people into that pipe as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And with streaming, I can say I can have 80 pipes, and they're all still coming back to me, and I still benefit from all of those. But I can have you know lots and lots of yeah, I can that's serve can every it. market individually, yeah. and yeah. that's what that's right. why you know we're not going to see. It's exactly I think what we're talking about with Rich Siegel, sports. which is a program that is designed. For for enthusiasts is always going to be the the thing that's designed for the largest possible audience you know and mm -hmm. uh and and i i'm a fan so good it's, We're, it's why sherlocking isn't really a thing because right. most of the time when apple does something for a mass they audience. do it for the masses yeah. and it's going to have 80 percent of the features and anybody right. who really cares about it is going to want to use that's something that's better it's a good point yeah. yeah unfortunately those of us who really care about it are probably not going to get an m2 ultra at least according to Mark <laughs> Gurman again, the uh, Apple scales back high-end Mac Pro plans. And it looks like they are also contracting to uh, build it in Vietnam. Uh, so, first of all, uh, you know, Apple has already, we must acknowledge, uh, missed its deadline. They said by the end of this year that they would have a new Mac Pro. They also uh, have not notably done an M2 Pro based mac mini uh i guess the studios are pretty good for a lot of people maybe that's all you uh, all you need but they haven't put an m2 in those either so uh what happened uh apparently apple was worried it was going to be too ex expensive the company wanted to do an m2 ultra which is uh what is that that's two chips stacked and then do a double m2 ultra which Mark says I call the M2 Extreme, T up to 24 cores in the Ultra, 76 graphics cores, 192 gigs of memory. But the Extreme would have been twice that, 48 cores, 152 graphics <laughs> cores. Here's the Otherwise, bad news. Pure according. happiness. I, they, they could have just called it pure happiness. Pure happiness. Like that, when they said pure happiness. I, you know, I, I can't even, I gave Lisa the, the Ultra version of the Mac Studio. And I took the pro version. I can't tell the difference, honestly. It's fine. I, I have to admit, I, I bring my Max. I, I bought the Max because I was like, I thought that the pro would be coming out. If I had known the pro was going to be delayed, I probably would have just bought the Ultra. Yeah. But I bought the Max and I bring it to its knees every day. Do you? All right. <laughs> like, yeah. I am not every doing day, photogrammetry, like, so maybe that's the difference. It is, it is mostly photogrammetry, but yeah. I wait for, you know, a solid. I, I, my last model it took like two hours for wow. it to through. With you, so. Wow. An M2 Extreme chip, according to Mark Gurman, probably not going to happen. The company has likely scrapped that higher-end configuration, which may disappoint Apple's most demanding users, the photographers, editors, programmers, Alex Lindsay. Uh, the company <laughs> made the decision because of the complexity and cost, says Gurman, of producing a processor that is essentially four M2 Maxes fused together. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that part of the problem is it may have affected the pipeline. It may have affected the productivity for the other computers. Like That's the, exactly the, the next the, sentence. Yeah. Yep. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. It will also help Apple and partner TSMC save chip production resources for higher volume machines. You know, yeah. that's where they make their bread and butter, right? You, right. They, they also were concerned about, about like, cost. Yeah. The cost would have been significant. I mean, the Max version, I mean, the Ultra version would have started at ten grand probably. Yeah, and then yeah, you talk yeah. about that extreme version and you're talking about and what percentage of the buyers are going to be in that category. I think that that's the challenge here, right, is they're already doing a Mac Pro. It's a niche product. I know it's important for the very high end, but it not, they don't sell that many of them. And then you talk about like, well, what about the highest end of the high end product? And then it's like a fraction of a fraction. And I can see them saying like, and looking at Mac Studio sales, perhaps even, and saying, look at the percentage of the sales that are of the the lower end chip versus the higher end chip, and knowing still, that also an M2 Ultra is going to have that uh, uh, amazing performance, it will be the fastest Mac ever when it comes out, and saying maybe you know maybe that's enough, maybe we don't need the the 4x for 20 yeah. grand that nobody's going to buy. And it could be you a know. pacing thing too. Like we don't, it doesn't make sense to do it right now. It might make sense to do it in 2024. Yeah. For M3 or M4 or something like that. Yeah. yeah. 
also also maybe they're looking at what they've got in the in, in the more conventional pipeline for CPUs next year and they're trying to figure out what argument do we make for making a $10,000 Mac that is not uh, $5,000 faster than the $4,800 Mac we can build uh, with the with simpler components but I th- but I, th- I do think it's mostly about the got to do you do you sell one ten thousand dollar Mac with four basically four uh, four dies on it or do you sell four Macs each with one die on it that you can pro- that can probably each be configured up to a four or five thousand dollar Mac. Every time I look at you, Andy, I want to start singing. Allons enfants de la patrie, le jour de croire est arrivé. One day more, <laughs> another day, another destiny. This man, he seems to know my crime. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's quite a quite a hat. I'm a little jealous. I, I, I'm a little jealous. I, again, you, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't know if they, I don't know if they still sell them at their shows anymore. Whatever the inter, current iteration of the Flying Car Matsov Brothers are. are. Oh, I would buy this that. Was, this, this Is was, this was gifted to me. It is velvet. It is. It's. It's not complicated. I'm, I'm sure, like rent fairs, sell something like that. But this. This was gifted to me from by Smerdjikov, Karim Matsov, wow. Sam Williams. So this is a a a, pers- a a personal item, but also it's like all right. You know, I've. I'm not. I'm not saying I look good on this. I'm, I'm saying that I enjoy wearing this, which is two different separate things, but both very valuable. I. Uh, I want. And there's, if you search for it, you will see, you will see that they actually are selling it on their, uh, on their store with a, a picture. Oh, this item is sold out. Oh man. But that's it. Right, Andy? Right there. This is, this is the classic. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. It was on Poshmark. A, and, and, and I think appropriate name, Flying Karamazov Brothers Dumb Hat. Uh, well, anyway, they, they, they actually they actually call it they actually call it the stupid hat. Stupid I don't know hat. if they call it the dumb hat. Oh, maybe okay. maybe that's maybe that's a knockoff. Okay, <laughs> it must be a knockoff. I just, the rest of us did not get the memo that it was hat day. That's what I'm <laughs> uh, every day is oh nice. You've got the uh, the official twit. This, this is the twit fez. I yeah. got the twit fez yeah. still right Very here. Very nice. Anytime I need it, it's right close by. Yeah, there you go. My fez still. Fez you needs. you still never know when this could be a fez emergency. It's like a like a fire extinguisher. Every every every, every time you change the clock back, change the clocks back. Make sure you change the batteries in your fez. Uh, still it's for sale. Fez, I will drill. give them a plug fez at drill. at Fezorama. That is the official Twit Brickhouse Chapeau, made to order. You can choose your tassel color. That's it. <laughs> Any color you want, as long as it's russet. Um, Gold for command, red for security, <laughs> there you go. blue for science. You can't. You Don't can't. get the red tassel. No, red tassel, you know what happens. Continuing on <laughs> with Mark Gurman's report, uh, this is this is what he thinks the Mac Pro will be. And you tell me, Alex, if this is a disappointment. It's expected to rely on a new generation M2 Ultra chip, uh, but will retain the Mac Pro Hallmark features of easy expandability for additional memory storage and other components. That's enough. Yeah, I have to admit that I would still probably be pretty tempted to buy it, even with the low. The, you know, I, I'd be like, well, it'd be really great to have that bigger chip. But at the same time, what the Mac Pro really brings that we don't have with the studio is the ability to add more memory, add a yeah. bigger hard so drive, expandability add, is important, and 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 cards. And right. putting in like like right now, every time I want to add a video card like a quad card from black magic or something like that i now have have to buy a sonic box that sits on the outside of it which is super weird um and uh, it'd be nice to just have it be able to put it into the computer like our old cheese graders so um so i think that those there's still a lot of opportunity the pro could could be the pro could literally have the same base specs as the studio and just have the external you know the ability to upgrade and a lot of people would buy it yeah. So, so I, I, I would love to see something bigger, but I, I, I would be fine. I'd probably buy it anyway. I think, I think you're going to be happy the about the new Mac Mini Pro, which will come yes. in regular, according to German, M2 yes. and M2 Pro variants. Um, early next year, I mean, maybe, I would hope. I'm, um, I'm hanging on. I'm hanging on. I need, I need to buy four more. And I'm just hanging on for dear, <laughs> yeah. dear life. Like, I've already bought. I think I've now bought. How um, would it be different like, than the studio, though? I mean, uh, the studio seems... Is it too I think tall well, for you? It's, it's, the, the, it's the a mini's going to just have th- just M2 and maybe M2 Pro, right? Whereas yeah. the studio it's has lo- Max and, and Ultra, so, yeah, right? Yeah, so they're yeah. they're more expensive and, and more powerful. And, okay. and the and the mini though is is I just don't want to buy. I don't know what I would need it for M2. Like the most of the Mac minis that I've bought already are eight gig, you know, base ones right. that 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 are still able, by the way, to put out eight 
um, eight uh, 1080p streams from from Zoom ISO. <laughs> so, yeah. so with this yeah. little mini, and so so the thing is, is that they're very very capable by themselves. I still work off of a studio, like my my main, and I wouldn't like one place that would probably make a difference is one of the things I do with my studio is I'm using Mimo Live, and then I'm having ISO coming coming out of Siphon into Mimo Live, and able to cut it. I, I think that a mini that would probably be the current mini that would probably be a little too much for it to do all of those things. Whereas um, an ultra, you know, or an M2 would probably be enough to do the entire production in a much smaller package. So I, I still, I think that there'd be a lot of advantages to it. The old, uh, the old uh, Mac pro was assembled in Austin at the flex plant. Uh, although assembled is, you know, the, the only thing that happened right. there and that was under pressure from uh, Donald Trump. It's expected Apple will build a new plant in uh, Vietnam and move production back to Asia. Uh, the mini, let's see. Oh, 16 inch MacBook pros also early next year with M2 pro and N2 max options. The rumor I like the best, and I don't, this is not a Mark Gurman rumor. This is, I think from Nikkei. Uh, is that there will be a 15-inch MacBook Air in the spring of 2023. That's intriguing. What do you think? Depends on how small the bezel is. It seems like you really have to keep within that... Uh, you have to keep within that tiny laptop bag format to make the Air make sense. Because if you have a large screen, large size uh, Air... Once again, you're making it even more complicated to try to decide between an Air and a MacBook Pro. Yeah. So it makes yeah, you wonder this what is if, if a poorly sourced. I mean, Ming Chi Kuo says it'll be end of this year. Uh, Ross Young, supply chain analyst, says it'll be early this next year. I, I, this is a little weaker than uh, than I think Mark's uh, Mark's story. Yeah, I, but I, I think I actually think it makes sense because the MacBook Air is Apple's most popular Mac and they only make one of it and one and with no variation. Right. And if you want to get a bigger screen and that's all you care about, you have to go up to the 2000 plus laptop that's got the multiple ports and the super fancy screen. And like, surely there is a place for something that's a little bit I'd bigger than I'd the 12 inch. Yeah. And it is their most popular product. I think for a reason that, yeah. uh, you know, people could buy a $2,000 MacBook pro, but they don't want to. And, and I imagine this will look like the M2 air, right? Like right. it'll literally be just a, a just pull out the Swollen margins of the, of, of the M2 air. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, for people who want a little more screen real estate or want to change the, uh, the scaling so that everything's a little bit larger because their eyes are aging. I think there's a lot of reason, especially that that laptop looks great. It's thin and light. So even a 15 inch version of it would be, pretty svelte i think uh, i think it's smart i think it's really smart now I, I don't think it adds complexity i think the the macbook pro line is weirdly complex with that 13 inch model but i think saying that they have two airs that are the same in all specs except the size of the screen right is That's fine clear. and yeah. and and it gives people more options for apple's most popular product to, mm. or a mac product new I, I know this i know this this is going to sound like semantics but does it sound as though it's time for Apple to just come up with something called the MacBook again? I, they tried it, right? I think. Yeah, I, know, I think but, the problem. But that, but that was, was there. Like we I, have the MacBook I, Air. Now we're going to come up with something even. I'm yeah, oh, sorry. There, go, go ahead. Your logic. Your logic is strong, right? Your logic <laughs> is strong, except that the name MacBook Air is already out there, and it's their most popular product, and it's not killing anybody. So yeah. I think I feel like they're going to keep it. I, I could make the same argument about iPhone, right? Like, why don't we call that Apple phone? Why is it still I like an iPod? And the answer is. It's doing great. Let's not change the name, right? And I think that's the truth of it because I agree with you. It should be MacBook and MacBook Pro. But the and it's same on the iPad, right? There's an iPad Air too that doesn't really make sense, but there it is in the middle of the product lineup and here we are. So I agree with you on the logic completely. I just think from a marketing perspective, they're not going to do yeah. it. I mean, overall I think that Apple has a real problem with SKUs. <laughs> just yeah, it's I think it's so. getting I I really feel like we're in the early like the early to mid 90s when as a person who loved apple i couldn't figure out which computer to buy you know and i think that we keep the subdivision right now it's not there yet it's i'm not saying it's there yet but i feel like if they don't pull these lines back together 
it's going to start getting to, well, I don't know if I need well, this. And that starts to create like a delay. You it's know? that 13-inch MacBook Pro that I would argue is the problem. I don't think two MacBook Airs and two MacBook Pros would be confusing at all. I think yeah, the problem is the there's 13. also that 13-inch Pro that doesn't have the features that the other models have. Because, uh, right, if you have two models, Pro and Air, and technically they're exactly the same, and the uh, like with each other, and the only difference is screen size. I feel like that actually makes sense. The problem but, is we also have this 13-inch Pro that isn't really Pro. It's kind of like an Air, but kind of not an Air, and that's where it starts to get so confusing. Right. I think that the the 14 and 16-inch Pro and a 13 and potentially 15-inch Air. I think that those could be pretty clear as long as you don't have that weird product in the middle that doesn't make any sense and that interferes with both of them. I've seen people, you know, articles that say, don't, whatever you do, don't buy the 13 inch MacBook Pro. It's a terrible compromise. I agree. It's, a, it's a weird, it's a weird compromise. Yeah. yeah. It's I mean, not a pro. Unless you really it's need not a, It's not a pro laptop. I mean, it's they not. They can it's, dump it's, that it's, from the line and add a 15 inch air. That would be great. Then it's you, there because mm. there are companies that will only buy MacBook Pros. They won't buy MacBook Airs because they perceive them to be non-professional computers. Oh, man. And they also With won't spend $2,000 on a laptop. And so Apple is, like, making a thing and calling it a Pro so that the companies will buy it that's less than 2000 Like, it, that's why it exists. Yeah. It, it, it's not, it doesn't make sense unless you're thinking about, like, corporate buyers. I have yeah. to say that's the, not the M2 Air... Uh, with I put 24 gigs of RAM in it. It's as fast as my Mac Studio. It's a it's a fantastic machine, and the battery life. It's such a great machine. Uh, I think most yeah. people who own it think it's the best computer they've ever had. I hear that again and again. You said that, Jason, right? Yeah, yeah, big fan. Yeah. Uh, yep. Don't get too excited Andy? about the M3. German says that's at the end of next year. Nothing else to say about that. <laughs> uh, all right, there's the. Oh, have any of you turned on advanced data protection? Not yet. No. I just, with, I just I just updated everything like over the weekend. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't updated it. Last week I, I was yet. gonna turn it on until I saw that I had to update seventeen things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hard, especially if you're like one of us reviewery types. It's like, yeah. oh my god. Like I have to find them all and, yeah. and what where are they? And do I log them out? And it's it's a lot. Where is it again, the advanced data protection? They hide it. I can't find it. And you can't, by the way, you can't search for it either. If you search for advanced data protection, it doesn't show up. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. It's like they I don't think. want you to do it. I wonder. Maybe. Is it I under, think they don't want you to do it by They're accident. just trying to reduce its attack surface profile. <laughs> is it under iCloud? Uh, should be, right? There it is. Advanced data protection. All right. Let's try again. Let me just want to curious how, what, turn, turn on advanced data protection. It's spinning. It's spinning. Oh, crap. I've got an Apple TV, a HomePod mini, uh, a HomePod full-sized. Whose iPhone is that one? Oh, man, my Apple yeah. Watch. There's still... Oh, look. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> it's still too much stuff. I'm going to bet nobody turns this on. If you guys haven't, I, I mean, who's going to turn this on? Uh, it's funny. There was a there was a piece in a major newspaper this week that basically said you should turn this on, and my wife saw this and asked me about it. And I'm like, oh boy. I'm like, yeah, it's nice. It's real complicated. <laughs> um, just not. Don't worry about it. I'll let you know later. Because I'm like, ah, oh, you know, like upgrading everything and then having to get the set up your legacy contacts and like, I think it's not a bad. A aspirational thing to do but like i'm not rushing out to do it today i gotta get i don't feel like there's TVs i'm also i'm also not feeling like i'm potentially under assault right now and i need to encrypt <laughs> right. everything right like right. it seems like this is more like good hygiene and not like exactly. do it immediately because yeah. the, the the attack is coming today yeah it's not, hopefully <laughs> no, not no all right let's take a little break picks of the week coming up we're gonna wrap this up but first, a word from our sponsor, Worldwide Technology, WWT. You've heard me talk about them for the last few years. Lisa and I went out there just before COVID, before the pandemic, to see their advanced technology center. <gasps> that is incredible. WWT is a forefront of innovation, working with clients all over the world to transform their businesses with the best enterprise technology. And it all comes down to this ATC, this advanced technology center, a researching and testing lab that brings together technologies from the leading OEMs, more than half a billion dollars worth of equipment. Uh, when they started it 10 years ago, it was in one building, a few racks. Now it's, it spreads over multiple buildings, 
it feels like miles of racks. It was so impressive. So impressive. The Advanced Technology Center offers hundreds of on-demand and schedulable labs featuring solutions that include technologies representing the newest advances in cloud and security and networking, primary and secondary storage, data analytics and AI, DevOps, all the stuff that you in enterprise would want to know about, right? And of course, initially they built that for the WWT engineers and partners to spin up proofs of concept, to do pilots, to see how things work, to learn about them. This way they can help their customers confidently select the best solutions. And it cuts the evaluation time down to weeks. I mean, it really can make a big difference. But here's the cool thing. WWT has virtualized the ATC. Members of the ATC platform can access these amazing resources anywhere in the world, 365 days a year, and it's free. With the ATC, you can test out products and solutions before you go to market. You can access, it's more than just schedulable hands-on labs. You can access technical articles, expert insights, demonstration videos, white papers. They also, WWT is, is famous for their events and their communities. It's where people go to learn about enterprise technology trends, to hear about the latest research and insights from their experts, and to try stuff before they buy. You're going to love WWT. They are the partner every enterprise should have when it comes to technology because they care about your business as much as they do about technology. They believe that technology only makes sense in a business if it, if it enhances your business strategy. They're business people and they understand that. Whatever your business needs, WWT, Worldwide Technology, can deliver scalable, tried and tested solutions that are tailored to fit you like a glove, perfectly. WWT, they bring strategy and execution together to make a new world happen. Learn more about WWT, learn about the ATC, and most importantly, gain access to all those free resources. Just go to WWT.com slash twit to create a free account on the ATC platform. I can't believe that they make it free. It's, it's such a boon. Everybody in enterprise should be doing this. WWT dot com slash twit we love worldwide technology We're, we love partnering with them and uh, i think you should check it out if, if you if you're an enterprise this is such a good solution wwt.com slash twit please use that address so they know that you didn't just wander in through the door that they, you saw it here wwt.com slash twit pick of the week time let's start with jason snell all right, well, you know, it's Christmas week, and I was thinking, is there anything I could recommend that's Christmassy? And if you are the user of a MacBook with a notch in the screen, so I a am. MacBook Pro or an M2 MacBook Air, yes. how about hanging some Christmas lights Oh, the notch? Oh, Craig how, Hockenberry's <laughs> at it again. How about that? Craig Hockenberry oh. from the Icon Factory, that guy, he is, he is can't be stopped. He can't be stopped. It's called Notchmeister. Notchmeister. It's free. It puts weird things under or hanging from or around your notch. Uh, and so it's like an ugly Christmas sweater for your MacBook. Come oh. on. It's free. Have a good time with it. Hang some Christmas lights on your MacBook's notch. And uh, it's, it's like not free just open Christmas source, lights. Too. So after the holidays, you could do other things, right? There's glowing things. And there's, you know, I, I suggested to him <laughs> the idea that, like, also, if you lose your cursor under the notch, have like the notch glow. And it does that so that you're like, oh, that, that's where it is. It's like the olden days of like uh, after dark and underwear and things like that, a talking moose where it's just like a silly thing that can run on your Mac. Kids, ask your parents what those were, by the way, or your grandparents. Uh, tiny, but it's tiny like that. Buddha. It's, I always like tiny it's, Buddha. Yeah, it's it's a it's software entertainment, right? It's yeah, not. It's no it's point. It's not solving world problems. It's just goofy and fun, and it's free. And what better time to hang Christmas lights? on your notch There's so no better get, a, time get her done no better time to decorate your notch than during the holidays i agree it is the best time I it's agree. the most wonderful time of the year for <laughs> your notch and you uh oh this is the best pick ever i can't wait to go home and try it notch meister it's in the mac <laughs> app store from the wonderful icon factory andy and pick of the week 
Uh, two holiday themed uh, theme picks. Uh, number one, you're going to be at a lot of family events over the next week or two, and that's a good time to uh, renew the old resentments when you <laughs> once again find out that, gee, how come uh, my grandparents' wedding portrait wound up at my cousin Shy's house? Yes. Uh, when, uh, I thought we were going to discuss like when we close down the house, who gets what? Uh, and it seems as though that she won't even like let me borrow it for just one weekend so I can scan it. Uh, and so, although I'm I'm all for like ruining the holidays by confronting relatives, uh, you uh, get uh, downloaded and install an app uh, by Google uh, for exactly this kind of problem. It's called Photo Scan. It is especially for just taking an existing photo, no matter where it is, uh, whether it's a, a print photo you've got uh, a, a, in a drawer you've put on your desk, or whether it's behind glass hanging on a wall. Uh, it's a very very streamlined app specifically for taking that photo and turning it into a very very good JPEG. So, for instance, if you've got uh, just uh, during one of the breaks, uh, I've have, I have a David Bowie uh, uh, MacWorld Expo uh, uh, concert poster on my wall, uh, and if I wanted to steal it because I was visiting my cousin and I thought, gee, I really would like to have that on my wall, it will t it will uh, use uh, uh, it will it will. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it will it will guide you towards kind of taking almost a panorama, like a four shot panorama, so you get it in high resolution, so that the uh, uh, so that the glare from the glass is not going to be a problem. It'll correct for uh, the uh, for the distortion if you're way, way up or way down, uh, and then it actually takes a very very good copy of that. It's not as good as borrowing it and then actually slapping it inside a scanner, but in terms of People who do not want that one, actually legitimately, we have exactly one copy of this 108-year-old photo, which is the only photo of our young immigrant grandparent uh, on Ellis Island. We don't want that to ever leave the house for any reason. There's no excuse for saying, well, can I lay it flat on the kitchen table and take a picture of it with my phone? Uh, if they say no, then you know that you have deep, deep, deep familiar problems that probably go far beyond a single photo. Good, It's good to have on your phone ready for when you do see something on a wall that you want to actually grab a copy of. I use it in museums a lot, too, uh, when there's something I just want a good copy of. Uh, and the, the pictures that it takes, you can edit it later on if you want, but it usually is high resolution enough and good enough. You can actually make a print from right from there. Uh, the other one is something that uh, Jason, I th I don't know whether Jason introduced me to it no. or whether we both I just, found out about it from Mark Weilage, uh, Mark Weilage's uh, uh, blog. Yeah, uh, the yeah I give you the credit here. Thank you. The the Comicraft New Year's Day font sale. Comicraft is oh, an amazing. You've done this comic every book. year for like 15 years, Andy. You mean mm -hmm. Jason told you about this first? No, no, Andy oh, Andy no. told me about yeah, it. Yeah, because I think and, Andy yeah, in 15 owns years, this. The price, is, yeah. the price has gone up by like 15 cents in those exactly. 15 years. <laughs> well, it's, not, it's not even keeping up with the flesh yet. So, so this, this is an amazing uh, company that... If you if you read digital comics, you have probably seen their typefaces in like Marvel, DC, and independent comics. Uh, they also have all kinds of like display and lettering fonts that you've probably as soon as you see it, you say, "Oh, wait a minute! I have I have a container of allspice that I bought <laughs> at the supermarket that has that font on it." Uh, they're professional level fonts. They're not like trash free fonts. Fonts they go from anywhere from like. 30, 30 or 40 dollars all the way up to like 200 300 400 dollars for a whole package and every year for the past like decade and a half maybe even two decades they've had a new year's day sale where the price of every single font is whatever the year is in pennies so it's, oh uh, they, haven't, they, haven't, they haven't updated the website to announce this, the, the sale yet, but I don't think they've canceled this year. So every font that you see there, no matter how expensive it is, will be $20.23. Uh, <gasps> even the ones that cost less than $20 will be, the price will be raised to $20.23 <laughs> uh, uh, for that day. And also another, another pro tip is that if you miss out on it and it's like January 2nd, try anyway because oftentimes they have a very loose definition of the word by midnight january 1st uh because you might find that they the that the price is still up every single year like i buy at least two or three fonts i've I bought like all the real huge expensive really wonderful ones uh that i have a lot of fun with uh, for really the, the the sign outside my window right now that says do not bother me i'm podcasting come in with a fire extinguisher and a fire and an emergency crew or don't come in at all, has this wonderful, beautiful, like hand lettered font and this beautiful, like, you know, like 1950s uh, sort of like scrawl, uh, like, a, like a, a scrawl sort of like a headline brushstroke font. It's again, it's, I'll use that salad dressing analogy. 
uh, if you buy, if you go there and you find a font that's really good for doing like a hand lettered sign, buy it, keep it on your, keep it on your, your computers, keep it on your devices. At some point you will have to like create a sign for like, here's where the party is. Here's where the, the, the here's where the, uh, the yard sale is, or again, keep out of the bathroom. Uh, it's broken. It will not do the, the, the fixture will not do the things you want it to do. Put it on, and put it on put it on the the door. Much better than whatever fonts came free, and much better with than whatever you can get freehand. Again, I'm a, Jason and I are both devoted fans. We both probably now have hundreds of Comic Craft fonts that we've bought two or three at a time over the past fifteen or twenty years. This is I yeah. love this. I've bought several uh, every year. You mention this, and yeah, I like to start to collect them. I there's one that's four hundred dollars. You telling me that'll be twenty dollars and twenty three cents? Every single thing will be twenty dollars and twenty three cents. Wow. The other nice thing, create an account because I can actually log back in and re-download every font yep. I've bought oh. over the past ten years. It's oh. really good. They, I mean, they, I've, I'll, I'll stop giving tips about this, but there's so many. To, there are too many to count. Like there's. Uh, like there's a really good like I think there's actually a, a, the font called Ho 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 or it might be called Yuletide, which is you'll from you'll recognize it when you see it. It's the, the basic like Christmas card like lettering sort of font that's really only good for Christmas cards and holiday cards. And you would never maybe you don't you don't kind of you're not going to spend seventy dollars for it, especially like the week after the holidays but for twenty dollars yes you will buy it and you'll put it in your font file and then and when october november comes around next year rather than saying gee how can i sort of like turkey up helvetica so it looks festive you can say oh no no i'll use that beautiful like call calligraphic holiday gift card font that i got for just 20 bucks last year i just want to buy this monol monologous which looks monologous, like the that's basic comic book font i have that it yeah. seems like so, that would so be a really good one to have so many of these are they're also they're also really sophisticated fonts like monologous is only uppercase is uppercase only but ah. it has a special trick built into it so that like uh if you have like a if, if you have two n's in a row two o's in a row or whatever obviously the fact that they look identical will give away the fact it's not hand lettered but they use the uppercase for one version of it oh. the lowercase for a different version of it they have other tricks where sometimes it will uh it will do uh, the, the the kerning for you automatically it'll stack things for you automatically uh i can't say enough about them though they and they update the fonts occasionally where you'll say oh by the way we've updated uh comma crazy so if you want a new version of it that oh, has nice. this new extra font technology go and get it it really is uh, quite good and if you buy monologous and soliloquous together then you get the upper and the lower and you're set yep. <laughs> it's 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 a lot it's a lot of fun like when i'm bored but i don't I, I need to keep my butt in the chair for another 45 minutes to like you know grab a panel from like a 1960s like marvel comic and just totally re-letter it <laughs> and it will and it'll look absolutely perfect too uh and just it will, re it will re represent your your gen x sarcastic uh rock and funk sensibilities Remember, instead of in that the of early uh, days of ios that was really popular there are three or four apps that would let you do take pictures and turn them into comic book panels and that kind yeah. of thing. Those are, I guess those are. Mark Sines, I think, had, com had a yeah. comic book uh, yeah. after, after he debuted Shatter on Mac Paint. Yeah. yeah, we went, yeah, sh yeah, remember that. That was awesome, yeah. Uh, Alex Lindsay, pick of the week. So a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, I talked about that we were seeing the FR7 coming out with from, from Sony and we were uh, wondering about it. <laughs> we, were, we were excited about it. We were excited about it on paper. A bunch of folks in office hours have actually bought them and received oh, them. And this is and, Sony's um, full frame pan tilt oh zoom interchangeable so lens camera. <laughs> so good. It is oh. it looks so pretty. It is um oh. so uh the there's a great uh web app that will control it. There is an iPad um controller, there is I have um, all the lenses. It you, seems like I yeah, should probably have it, this. Oh it's it I just, don't know what I do with it. <laughs> well, I, I think they're going to make they're going to make about as many of these as they can. Uh, they're going to sell as many as they can make. You know, yeah. they they this is, you know, it's still pricey for a camera. It's this is a ten thousand dollar camera. <gasps> you know, it's not like a Yikes. but <laughs> but it looks like a film camera, but it's a PTZ that you can use in your podcast studio or, right. you know, they sh I think that Sony, I think they're trying to position it by showing it doing all these film things that I would never use it for. Right. Um, but. But as a, um, you may, if, if suddenly my background gets even softer and it suddenly, you know, looks different, you'll know that I got one. Um, but, but we, we tested it. Um, a bunch of people have tested it. They've already used it in productions and it just, it just looks really, really good. And we did a whole hour, which is one of our better second hours. I mean, it just turned out really good because you have people who, 
They've already gotten to use it. They've already used it in production. They're answering people's questions. And so last Thursday's um, office hours, we we went through it. And uh, so there's like a second hour there that's all, if you're interested in it, I would definitely check it out because it's, it is it um, is an incredible, uh, inc- it looks like an incredible camera. It's like game changer camera. It's I don't think you very put on a, uh, on a jib or... You can put it on a jib, but you can put it just on a tripod and yeah. then it'll just, you know, you can, I mean, they're very aggressive about showing it at all. You're going to use it in filmmaking and you might right. use it in filmmaking, but right. um, there's broad, if you're a broadcast studio that wants to stop looking like t- old TV, right. um, <laughs> if you are, you know, um, like, I mean, I'm talking about like, you know, news organizations. Can you do shaky you cam with sticks. it and all of it makes it look like it's handled? Yeah, you probably could <laughs> if, some if you worked hard enough Intern jiggling it. the tripod leg. <laughs> yeah, but it's a... Uh, it's pretty slick. So, Hey, everybody. It's Leo Laporte, the uh, founder and host of many of the uh, Twit podcasts. I don't normally talk to you about advertising, but I want to take a moment to do that right now. Uh, our mission statement at Twit, we're dedicated to building a highly engaged community of tech enthusiasts. That's our audience. And you, I guess, since you're listening, by offering them the knowledge they need to understand and use technology in today's world. To do that, we also create partnerships with trusted brands and make important introductions between them and our audience. It's how we finance our podcasts, but it's also, and our audience tells us this all the time, a part of the service we offer. It's a valued bit of information for our audience members. They want to know about great brands like yours. So can we help you by introducing you to our highly qualified audience. And boy, you get a lot with advertising on the Twit podcasts. Partnering with Twit means you're going to get, if I may say so humbly, the gold standard in podcast advertising. And we throw in a lot of valuable services. You get a full service continuity team supporting everything from copywriting to graphic design. I don't think anybody else does this or does this as well as we do. You get ads that are embedded in our content that are unique every time. I read them, our hosts read them. We always over deliver on impressions. And frankly, we're here to talk about your product. So we really give our listeners a great introduction to what you offer. We've got onboarding services, ad tech with pod sites. That's free for direct clients. We give you a lot of reporting so you know who saw your advertisement. You'll even know how many responded by going to your website. We'll also give you courtesy commercials that you can share across social media and landing pages. We think these are really valuable. People like me and our other hosts talking about your product sincerely uh, and informationally. Those are incredibly valuable. You also get other free goodies, mentions in our weekly newsletter that's sent out to thousands of fans. We give bonus ads uh, to people who buy a significant amount of advertising. You'll get social media promotion too. But let me tell you, we are looking for an advertising partner that's going to be with us long term. Visit twit.tv slash advertise. Check out our partner testimonials. Tim Broom, founder of IT Pro TV. They started IT Pro TV in 2013, immediately started advertising with us and grew that company to a, a really amazing success. Hundreds of thousands of ongoing customers. They've been on our network for more than 10 years. And they say, and I'll quote Tim, We would not be where we are today without the Twit Network. That's just one example. Mark McCrary, who's the CEO of Authentic, uh, he was actually uh, one of the first people to buy ads on our network. He's been with us for 16 years. He said, and I'm quoting, the feedback from many advertisers over those 16 years across a range of product categories is that if ads and podcasts are going to work for a brand, they're going to work on Twit shows. I'm proud to say that the ads we do over deliver, they work really well because they're honest they have integrity our audience trusts us and we say this is a great product they believe it they listen our listeners are highly intelligent they're heavily engaged they're tech savvy they're dedicated to our network and that's partly because we only work with high integrity partners that we have thoroughly and personally vetted i approve every single advertiser on the network If you're ready to elevate your brand and you've got a great product, I want you to reach out to us. Advertise at twit.tv. So I want you to break out of the advertising norm, grow your brand with host-read authentic ads on twit.tv. Visit twit.tv slash advertise for more details or email us 
Advertise at twit.tv if you're ready to launch your campaign now. Officehours.global. You could see how uh, how the pros uh, and office hours have used it as well as so many other things, including cooking. And there's some there's a little mid journey Chewbacca. <laughs> we that Wookiee you definitely bit. want to let win. I am not yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's, he's a lot smarter than you are. Yeah, yeah definitely yeah, exactly. want that one to win. Uh, thousandth yeah. show. Congratulations. That was yesterday. Little party there. A uh, whole lot of great stuff. Officehours.global. There's a Zoom you can join and be part of it. Uh, of course, there are videos uh, after the fact, and all of the information is there at officehours.global. So if you want to join, click the Join Us button. And uh, the week is going to be a good week, it looks like. You did, yeah. you did a Q&A this morning, Mix Minus. John, we should go to that one. Whole hour in Mix Minus. We should go to that one. That's on Wednesday. <laughs> that's that's going to be a good one. Uh, LIDAR education. Yeah, we're talking about specifically LIDAR uh, as it relates to like the phone and stuff like nice. that. So we'll be Nick Justin from Drexel University will be in and uh, talking about it. So it should be nice. That's officehours.global. If you want to hire Alex, you know, and play with the big boys, uh, run with the big dogs at 090.media. Thank you, Alex. Andy Anaka, when are you going to be on GBH next? Uh, I am on this Thursday at uh, 1230 Eastern Time. Go to WGBHnews.org to stream it live or later via audio. Uh, or go to the WGBH News channel on YouTube to watch it stream. Not sure if I'll wear the stupid hat. I, I might see if I can get away with that because I don't like to have to comb and brush my hair. <laughs> I think you should at, definitely as early wear as 1230 that. I think they would enjoy that. <laughs> Thank I'm doing you. I'm doing it remote I'm doing it remotely so I can at least mute the mute the audio so I don't hear them laughing. So <laughs> there's that. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Jason. Happy Christmas. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna wish you all happy Christmas in a second. Oh, I just want to get all the plugs in here. Jason Snell, uh, sixcolors.com, the incomparable, all the That's great it. podcasts. Sixcolors.com slash Jason Leo. I made a new page just for you. <gasps> oh, so it's, it's just your podcast. It's now. just me and my podcast. So you can check that out. At six colors, I'm not even. I don't not even mind you plug yet. in other people's podcasts, too. but yeah. Anyway, that's look that's at this where you is all it. of the shows you do. Good lord. Yeah, I mean, most of them are seasonal and they come and go, and okay, then some okay. of them are not seasonal. But you know, you should talk. You should talk. I You've should got talk. Lots of podcasts yourself. <laughs> I got a anyway, few. Anyway, six dot the incomparable dot com. Check them out. A couple at relay fm and uh, this one Mac Break Weekly too. And thank you for bringing me into your family this we year. We love having you here. I am a newcomer here. Yeah, so thank no, you. you're not really a newcomer. We we we've had you. I've known you since Call for Help on Tech the TV days. for crying <laughs> out right. loud. Uh, that's more than uh, 20 years. That's like 25 years or something like that. Um, thank you, all three of you. We will not be here next week. It's a best of Mac Break. We'll be back January 3rd which means we will be back before Orthodox Christmas, but not until after the regular thing and New Year's. Andy and Jason and Alex, I hope you have a wonderful holiday. I hope you do great things. You sous vide that burrito. You do whatever it is you do <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the holidays. I know, Jason, you're going to go spend time with family, which is great. Uh, Alex, your family comes along with you everywhere you go, so you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have the to in-laws are visiting, so we're, we're going to have a and, good time. And Andy, uh, are you you got anything planned for the holidays this year? Uh, I got plans. Uh, probably my car will break down just outside of town. My really fancy, expensive car that I've the status car that I've been saving for all my life. It will cause me to wonder. Really, why am I so hung up on material things? And during that long, long walk back, it will be that simple, broken down pickup truck that Jason in his, in his garage uh, that I that I mocked so much that will pick me up and remind me of what Christmas is all about. The real meaning. Airing four Christmas. times a day on Lifetime between now <laughs> and Boxing Day. Happy Brought Christmas. Brought you by Pro Concentrate. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy Festivus. When is the Festivus? Have we missed Festivus already? Is it today? We better get the pole out. <laughs> we gotta get we gotta get hustling here. Where's we have an aluminum pole? Twenty third, right? Oh, so we got a we couple got, of we days. We got time. Okay. It's Friday. Okay. It's Friday is Festivus. The airing of grievances still to come. <laughs> Thank you, all of you, too. I uh, I really appreciate uh, the fact that you show up for Mac Break Weekly. You listen to it. Uh, I hope you listen to it every week. You know what a great holiday gift for yourself 
or the geek in your life would be a membership in our club twit it's less it's a buck less than a blue check and you get so much more <laughs> uh you get of course ad free versions of all of our shows including shows we don't put out in public like hands on macintosh with micah and uh, Paul Thorat's hands-on uh, Windows and the Untitled Linux show. You also get access. Those are all in the Twit Plus feed to the Discord, which is a wonderful party uh, going on uh, around the clock. We're talking about not just the shows, but but everything. Uh, you know, anything that geeks would like. I spent a lot of time in the coding section over there, asking, begging for help with our advent of code puzzles. Seven bucks a month. It's a club. You want to be in twit.tv slash club twit. It's a club we want you to be in, and it really does help us uh, keep the lights on, keep the staff employed. Um, so we really thank you for it. It also supports the Mastodon instance, the discourse forums, the IRC, all of that. Twit.tv slash club twit. There is a yearly subscription, which would be an excellent last minute holiday gift for the geek in your life. I'm just, I'm just saying. Happy holidays, everybody. Have a great New Year's Eve and New Year's. Stay safe, stay well, and we will see you next year. But now, I'm sorry to say, it's time to get back to work because break time is over. See you next year. Hey there, I'm Micah Sargent. Look, as a geek myself, I feel it's only fair if I admit something. We can be kind of hard to shop for. So what do you get for that geek in your life who has everything already? Well, a Club Twit gift subscription, of course. Twit podcasts keep them informed and entertained with the most relevant tech news podcasts available. With a Club Twit subscription, they're going to get access to all of our podcasts ad free, exclusive outtakes, behind the scenes, and special content. And I love this exclusive shows like my own Hands on Mac and Hands on Windows from Paul Therott, as well as the Untitled Linux Show. So purchase your geek's gift at twit.tv slash clubtwit and they will thank you every day.